welcome. Bienvenidos to Sucio Talk. Hope you're enjoying your commute, your walk, your workout, your cooking, whatever the hell you're doing while you listen to this show. Um, don't be doing anything weird, all right? Uh, anything. Anyway, uh, episode 13, uh, Chef Derek Wagner. Uh, I met him many years ago in college. I used to go to his restaurant quite a bit uh, for for brunch. Um, it's an institution in Providence, Rhode Island, for having you know upscale breakfast, lunch, brunch, fair. Um, always had great meals there, um, and it was a really big buzz in Rhode Island at the time. You know, being in culinary school, a lot of kids looked up to that restaurant and Chef Derek. Um, and wanted to work there, whatever it may be. But we all talked about eating there all the time and pretty much at least once a month on a Sunday, we were, we were at Nick's on Broadway. So if you're ever in Providence, uh, once this weirdness ends, check it out. I think they're doing uh, to go right now. Um, but I don't think indoor dining ever closed in Providence, Rhode Island, which is kind of crazy, but, uh, you know, it's the wild, wild east out there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, shout outs this week. I got Dalton, my boy Dalton Thomas. I used to work garmage with him at the restaurant at Meadowood. He did a fried chicken pop up this past week. Um, so shout out to him. He said it went, went great. Uh, my, my other buddy Charlie Apple went and ate a sandwich. He said it was delicious. Um, on that note, uh, Charlie Apple's, uh, longtime companion dog, uh, Doja, um, passed away. So rest in peace to Doja. If you know Charlie, make sure to, to reach out and give me your condolences. Um, it's sad, you know, when anybody loses their pet, a living thing that's been with them for so long, you know, so, uh, my heart goes out to him. I know how hard it is to, to lose a dog. Um, brings up my childhood dog, Casper, you know, friendly neighborhood dog. Um, he was small, but he wasn't yappy, you know, so that he always gets a sort of a personality to him. Um, so RIP Casper, now you can, now you can hang out with Doja up there in, in doggy heaven. All right. Um, other than that, no, not much news in, uh, in, in my world back in, uh, in California. It's nice and sunny out here. Um, Started a nice uh, hiking regimen in the mornings. Getting the three to three to five miles out here. You know what I'm saying? Uh, strengthening those those legs and the, and the mind as well. While I'm out there listening to uh, "Can't Hurt Me" by David Goggins right now, audiobook on uh, on Amazon, and it is fucking amazing. So check it out, David Goggins. Can't hurt me. Um, other than that, next week. It's episode 14. It will be Chef Jake Rojas. Um, now, mind you, I, I recorded all these episodes while I was in Rhode Island. Um, so most of these go back at least you know a week, two weeks. But uh, it was cool to get to sit down with a chef that when you were younger, you looked up to and he helped mold your career into what it is today. You know, he was the one that told me, if you want to be the best, you got to go work with the best. So that's one of the only reasons, um, or one of the biggest reasons, I should say, that I went to go work at the restaurant at Meadowood. Uh, so shout out to him. So that's next Monday. Again, I plan on dropping these on Mondays. What happens is sometimes shit happens and I can't get guests on or anything like that. And, uh... You damn well don't want to hear about my life twice, okay? So I think what I'll do is to try to to mitigate that when we don't we don't really have a uh, a guest is uh, I've been recording uh, thoughts sort of while while out in the world, um, funny things here and there. So I'll probably just fucking make a compilation of that and put it out as a podcast in case I don't have any. Uh, any guests lined up, but you know, 
usually I do, but you know, shit happens. Shit happens. Um, hopefully all of you are signing up to get your vaccinations so we can, uh, open the world back up here and go to a death metal concert. You know what I'm saying? I'm dying over here. Last live music show I saw was Slayer in, uh, the SAP Center in San Jose. Wild show. It's the first time that I'd ever saw a metal show not in a dingy, shitty bar. You know, a metal show that was in a stadium. Um, and the fucking mosh pit was literally the entire floor of the SAP Center. It was awesome. Uh, so, but it's funny because it was Slayer's fourth retirement tour. So I'm like, I'm like, are you gonna retire or what? What's going on? But anyways, uh, so next week's episode, Chef Jake Rojas um, also has some weird happen to me. Somebody made a fake David Susio account, fake David Susio account on Instagram. So I guess that means I'm getting there, getting famous. But also, I think it's a weirdo that that made that. Maybe it's just an automatic computer that makes those fake profiles, but, you know, just some weird person just making fake profiles and filling out people's Wikipedia page. You know, just get a job, guys. Go out. Go running. Go hiking or something. You know, it's kind of sad. But, um, anyways, I'll stop uh, ranting here. Uh, please enjoy Chef Derek Wagner, episode 13. Next week, Chef Jake Rojas. The week after that, I'll give you a little sneak peek. A little sneak peek. The week after that will be Chef Daniel Verano. Uh, Chef Daniel Verano was my first chef in high school. Meaning he ran, you know, I went to vocational school. So he ran the program there. Um, and it's pretty interesting man you know he comes from you know i don't want to offend him but he's old as fuck you know what i mean like <laughs> he's lived a life let's say you know he was in music um and what's cool is he was in the uh, the culinary olympics which happened in in berlin um for a long time just sort of that you know respect to the craft white coat tall hat uh you know a chef you know so uh, but he was in my formative years of training and, you know, one of those guys that if it wasn't for him, you know, I wouldn't be sort of put on the right path uh, to success and to uh, wanting to explore more about food. So shout out to Chef Daniel Barano. Again, that's two weeks from now, two Mondays from now. Sucio Chalk driving, dropping every Monday. All right, guys. Enjoy the show. Uh, this is a long one, but a good one. And uh, Chef Derek Wagner, ladies and gentlemen, Sucio Talk. Environment that you're constantly using levity. Yeah, to I've, keep, I've, I started to recording because it sounds, you yeah. sound good right now. Oh, great. Let's do it. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Um, you know, there's... Is that is that music okay in the background? Yeah, that's yeah, cool. lovely. Yeah, felonious monk. This is and, this is like just it's so kind of serene in here. Set, yeah, it's like I'm constant. You know, again, like being like a I'm gonna bounce around like a. I, this that's is my fine. That's cup fine. Of coffee. I'm like yeah. S- so super let, energetic. Let's, let's just do the intro real quick. Yeah, this is yeah, Sucio Talk. It. This is um, I'm sitting here with uh, with Chef uh, Derek Wagner of Nick's on Broadway, and uh, I'm sure other projects that I will learn about. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me into your home. It's beautiful. We just talked about the house, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about it again on the show. Uh, I just had to press record because it seemed like we were going to get into something <laughs> good. So I was like, "Let me, let, let's do it." Yeah. So Susie Talk episode, what is it? Thirteen. Episode thirteen. It's lucky my, number thirteen. It's my lucky number. Let's do it. We're all, on we're Friday all the coffee'd 13th. up over here. Yeah. Social distance. Yeah. You know what I mean? Doing Abs- all the thing. Let's go. Chef. The 2021. Um. Yeah, man, it's uh, it's crazy with this this lifestyle and this work and and just our craft and where our headspace is and I guess you know you, what came first the, the the chicken or the egg right? It's like did we gravitate towards this 
line of work into this this world. You know, tame and hone certain senses, and I, I would I would venture to say that it's a little bit of both. And I think part of dealing with stress and anxiety and uh, both on the, you know, so on the, on that side of things, but also on the, just constantly make people and, and how can you EQ everything in the environment just to dial in making somebody feel good. Right. And that yeah. comes down to like, yes, of course we, the, the big ones, right. Food, like taste, smell, uh, visual, but it goes beyond just the food and the drink, right? It's like the lights, the air temperature, yeah, you know, the vibe, like just setting a vibe first, I think it's just so important in terms of like putting someone in the mood. It's like yeah. trying to get them, you know, when, when somebody walks into a space and, and, you know, every space develops its own like electricity, like whether you did it intentionally or not, yeah, um, it, it just finds itself uniquely that space, right? And if you pay attention to that and you're like, okay, you know, I want people to feel like this or I want to feel, I want to feel like this. It can be totally self-serving, right? Yeah. It's like, I just want to chill, right? Like my life is crazy. My brain is a thousand Fucking miles great. an hour. <laughs> yeah, like when I, I need to decompress so that I can get in a creative space so I can soothe the machines that are going a thousand miles an hour in my in my brain and yeah. in my chest pumping and the and anxiety and stress and pressure so i'm constantly looking for that chill vibe yeah you know? i hear you so i'm like how do you know count my candles like lights you know soft lights no like no lights i'm like such a cave kind yeah, of person like of, i just it, I, like I mean to, this place is perfect the the uh, I like the way you can look into the kind of the staircase and all mm -hmm. that through the door mm -hmm. and, you know, and, but it's, even though it's uh, dark in here, it's light. Yes. Like all the shades are down, but it's like still bright enough to have some thoughts. Yeah. So yeah. I do like that. So here we are chilling. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> um, so chef, you know, Sucio talk, we take it all the way back. So we're going to, you know, get into your childhood a little bit. Where are you from? Uh, I grew up not too far from here in, um, Greenville, Rhode Island, uh, about 25 minutes from here. It's, you know, in Rhode Island, we, we talk about <laughs> when some, when you ask them where they're from, they will give you a town or a village name that you're like, is that even a place? I don't even know. Yeah. It's uh, in Smithfield, the town of Smithfield, and it's just part of that town that sort of held on to it. Okay. Kind of name, you know, it's such a, you get up into the Northeast, the, the, the towns are so old, right? They've been here for so long that they're, you know, they were once even smaller, like yeah. little villages or, or parts of the town that had each had names. And um, so just like when we're in Providence, you're like, oh, the restaurant's in Olneville, right? It's like in Providence, but it's in exactly. Olneville. Or, yeah. you know, we're on the west side or we're in Federal Hill. Yeah. We're on the east side. It's sort of it's sort of like uh, like Napa because when I got there, I was like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, the like the French Laundry and the restaurant in Meadowood are in this town, right? And they're like, no, they're like fucking... 45 minutes north. What are you talking about? I'm like, oh, all right. Well, I guess you know, got that one wrong. Right. Exactly. Except, except in Rhode Island, it's 45 seconds, but it's still a Very different, true. but it's still a different town or a different name. Yeah. Rather, you it's know, a different same town. It's a different uh, mentality distance wise too, mm -hmm. because you tell people, Hey, my drive is 20 minutes to work. And they're like, are you crazy? Yeah, because like, you know, 20 minutes in Rhode Island is Massachusetts. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like you're, you're literally in another state. <laughs> you're literally in another state. And that's uh, funny. It's like economy of scale like yeah. also shrinks with perce you know perception yeah. also changes with that. And you know, it's so population dense for the site, you know. And yeah. We joke about that constantly. Like even we'll have, you know, over the years when we go and do like a charity event in Newport and we're doling out food and folks are coming to the table and they're like, "Oh, this is so good. Where are you?" Where are you guys from? And, oh, Providence. Or oh, we're from we're on where where's the restaurant located? They'll say that yeah. was my favorite. And we'll say, oh, it's on it's on Broadway. And they're like, oh, I, I've never seen that. I'm like, in in Newport, no Broadway in Providence. And oh, Providence. Oh, yeah. We don't, 
We don't go there. We don't you know, go to Providence. total disengagement. <laughs> in total, like, oh, have a nice day. Like, we'll see you later. Talk about it. Talk. And you're like, it's 20 minutes away, yeah. man. Why like, wouldn't you oh, go why, there? Why wouldn't yeah. you go? They're I just think... like, oh, we don't, we don't go over the bridge, you know. Yeah. We, don't, we don't travel far. And it... Again, I think it was like one of those behaviors, and who knows, I wasn't alive 200 years ago, but I'm constantly thinking like, why do things work the way that they do? Like, it's yeah. just the way my brain works. And you're like, just like these narrow roads or smaller, more compact townships, yeah. they predate modern conveniences, yeah, right? Sure. And so people have just developed over years this real embedded sense of, community and mm -hmm. everything I have is close yep. everything I have I need right here um, so venturing out is a, is a venture you know yeah, it's, a, it's sure. a real it's a real adventure um, and it's I mean you, you know you, you've lived here for a long time and uh, and you, you've been all over traveling too so you you, you see the 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 difference in yeah. other in other places <laughs> other mentality you know you go to New York and like a 25 minute, 40 minute commute, bus, subway, train, taxi is, is one of three or four times that you would even think about making that kind of trek yeah, yeah. during the day, if not more. Right. And here it's like, You'd plan your week around, you know. You yeah. plan your week around. Oh, then you gotta go to Newport like, on Tuesday. A half an hour fucking... drive, forty-five <laughs> minute drive. Like, are we gonna stay over? Are we gonna stay over? Yeah. Are we like we're we gonna pack a that bag? Is wild. It's, it's so true. crazy. I yeah. used to stay over in Newport when like we'd have parties and shit over yeah. there. I mean, uh, for safety reasons. Yeah, yeah. But still, it's like you know, it's forty-five minutes away. <laughs> it's not, you know. But now it's um, you know, living in California, I'll drive six hours, no problem. No. You know, I when I drove down um, where I'm living now in SoCal, it's like I just got in my car. I was like, well, I didn't even think anything of it. And in two days, I had changed my whole life. It was just like from Napa, see you later, fucking here we go. So that was that was a wild drive. But if I told anybody here that I did that, they'd be like, excuse me, <laughs> you know, six hours, you're in Pennsylvania. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So it's like to them, it's like six fucking hours, dude. Remember the first time I took a road trip, uh, I went from I did the U. Rhode mm -hmm. Island, down, mm -hmm. Tennessee, uh, D.C., New Orleans, Texas. When we got into Texas, I remember looking at the exit sign on the highway, and it was like, exit 4,970. And I was like, excuse me? You know, up until that point, I had only seen exit 99. Yeah. It's yeah. like the largest number exit. And I was like, this is crazy. That's so funny. I, mm -hmm. I, I have a, like, it was a Texas size epiphany when I was in high school. It was the first time I ever took an airplane uh my best friend in, in high school his sister was going to a and m yeah he was originally from texas um so we got our parents to let us go and visit his sister um you know it was we were 18 and 19 at the time i think uh it was our senior year yeah but it was the first time i'd ever been on an airplane and his grant we were we were flying into college station to to see his sister at a and m and then we were taking her car or renting a car, I can't remember, and driving to Lubbock to see his grand grandmother. And I just had no, you know, you see it on the map your whole life. You see things you really don't know unless you're on the ground and like get the context yeah. of the terrain. And you know, we drove for over 10 hours. Oh my God. And we were still nowhere near like going through the whole yeah, state and that to. was to my like my mind when i was a kid we took that yeah. car trip and drove down to florida which is crazy my mother god bless her she was like <laughs> took three teenagers in a, in a in a station wagon to drive oh to see my god, grandparents bro. but you're like you know you're thinking like you go through eight nine states you you, you feel like you're going a long time exactly yeah and then you go to texas and you're like oh you haven't even gone across the yeah, state anywhere. never mind north to south the whole th like you're just and you're 10 11 hours deep yeah. into this drive like san antonio to houston that's like six yeah. eight hours yeah and 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 it to me that was like a wow i gotta get out there man yeah there's i gotta, other, I gotta there's get out others, there there's more you know, shit like, out there yeah there's just sure. so much shit out there and it and it i'd always wanted to travel to see different places but just you know having it was almost like it hits you on a different 
a different dimension because it's actually like a spatial thing and you're just like holy shit like yeah. this is crazy and like eyes are wide open and just like, <laughs> you know you're like, god we're so tiny man we're so yeah tiny. i know so Rhode Island's lived, so tiny. Now that country, that where you lived, was that countryside or was it kind of just suburban or any town in Rhode Island, which is, has everything? Yeah, so <laughs> you know? it, it was, um, it was uh, definitely a mix of like old country going into suburban like yeah, it's like I, north kingston kind of yeah, yeah, like, yeah 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 exactly it was like there was um you know it was, it was called i lived in the part of right and the part of greenville called apple valley yeah like where there was just a lot of or, a, apple orchards there there were still like three apple orchards when i was a kid that were pretty close by uh it was definitely i remember a lot of um one of the things i loved about it was there were a lot of trees and there was you know, uh, it wasn't urban by any, by mm-hmm. any means. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of playing outside, a lot of like, you know, hiking and things like that. Yeah. But it definitely at, through my childhood transitioned into way more developed, you know, Hell still yeah. suburban. Yeah. Um, definitely like full fledged, like suburban, much more population dense. Yeah. Um and a lot of lot more development going yeah, on there I think, now. Yeah. Uh, what's cool about um uh you know what's going on in Rhode Island is like it's updating but it's still staying true to its classic mm-hmm. roots. Mm-hmm. So like those old neighborhoods are preserved, but then all around it is everything fucking else that you know that's it's like newport yeah <laughs> you know like yeah. it's super historic and then you go somewhere and you know there's obviously your mcdonald's and whatever else so it's like, yeah and there and you know and there's some there's ups and downs to to that too you yeah. know but things change times change and For sure. um you hope that you can hold on to a piece of it i mean i do because i i'm so nostalgic and it's part of the like, sensory memory is just something that like makes me tick so i'm constantly looking back mm-hmm. um so I think, you know, I have that inclination to like, I wish like certain things like that, especially the aesthetic or mm-hmm. the, the feel would stay true to its like, yeah, historic sure. self, yeah. you know, um, but things also have to evolve and things change Things also have too, to evolve and change, you know? yeah, so for sure. it goes back to that like sort of like balance, you know, what's the balance? What's yeah. the pursuit of balance? And- it, it seems like a happier place than when I was here. <laughs> Not saying that it wasn't happy when I was here, mm-hmm. but it just seems like things have improved. They're, you know, moving forward with things mm-hmm. that were in construction when I was mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. It was a very transitional period during that time. Yeah. 2007 to 2011. Yeah. And that was year. also, you think about like 2007. So that was right on the back end of the recession. Exactly. Right? So exactly. that was a hard, it was a real yeah. hard time. It was just like everything stopped. And the Everything highways stopped. were cluttered with the Everything fucking stopped. orange cones. Money ran out everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, I was in the middle of business. Like that was a crazy, crazy time to be in business. Yeah. Um, and it literally everything just stopped yeah. for a few years it was, it was um, because of the economy and what was going on. Um, you know, but it's funny that you mentioned that too. And like I think about this with my life too, and you, like part of it is what's actually going on around you, but. Part of it's also what's going on in you, inside you, yeah. and what's going on mm-hmm. in your life, right? And as when you're when we're young, we we just we don't always pay attention to the you no. know the juxtaposition of both of those things. Mm-hmm. Just like so many in, in you know being in staying in Providence and having so many friends that were like couldn't wait to get out of here from college. That were yeah, like, oh, I can't fuck this place. <laughs> fuck this place. Yeah, I'm out of here. Place. This place sucks. It's yeah. awful. And then leaving, right? And then either moving back a couple of years yeah. later or looking back at with a totally different perspective. Mm-hmm. And I miss Providence. I want to come visit, you know, or literally moving their life back here. Yeah. And you don't. So only in the re, right hindsight is is incredible. And like only being like a, you know, a student of of like yourself and like look and just kind of paying attention to what's going on and. And seeing these patterns repeat and like, you're like, wow, it's like not necessarily just, yeah, things have changed here as they do everywhere and in a lot for the better. But it's also just like where you are where as a you, person yeah. and, and just 
being like, you know, I'm ready to like, okay, wait, I was in college. Like I'm stressed out. I don't know what I want to do with my life. It's like the, you know, there's the talk about being like a preteen before you're a teenager. It's like the post, yeah. the post teen, you know, like d- anxiety, depression. Like, what am I going to do with my life? Who am I? Am I I've been right seeing thing? the same people for the last couple of years. I mean, I'm, I don't want to, t- I don't want to do homework anymore. Yeah, exactly. You know, I need to, I need a, I need a, you know, big boy or big girl, uh, things and apartments. Yeah. And I want to like not be sleeping on, on a mattress on the floor or on milk crates or, <laughs> you know, like, like all these, all these things that are going through your brain and your mind and your life. Uh, and I'm so like, how many times we're going to have ramen this week? Like, yeah. Um, yeah. and the struggle, it, you apply those, those like feelings and those anxieties to where, where you are physically not just where you are mentally, mentally yeah. you know and just in your life um and i don't know i think it's you know and, and when you're trying to pinpoint and dissect things like it's important to kind of understand what what pieces mm-hmm. are causing a lot of what yeah, yeah yeah absolutely like or, how, or at least it's interesting maybe that. not important but to me it's very interesting and, i hear that and um because i'm constantly trying to pull things apart to see how they work or to dial in the the variable right like yeah. it's like that scientific and creative process of like okay like which thing is the thing that i want to change here because if yeah. i change too many things i don't know what i'm doing it's i don't like know a car you're yeah just like, yeah. You're like okay it. is it the alternator or is it the car yeah, it's yeah, like, what do i do what's going on here I mean, I, I think about that too, is you think about, um, your strong opinions and then you, I always break them down. Mm-hmm. And I was like, mm-hmm. was well, that the, is that the best way to think about this thing? Mm-hmm. So I think I formulated, uh, sort of a thought that no opinion is like infinite. Like there's always ways to change mm-hmm. the way you think about something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so. I just don't think you should lock yourself into a box by being like, I believe this and totally. You know. it's, yeah. It's, we don't try to have some perspective, perspective, like, you know. perspective and room for flexibility. Yeah. And change. And is, knowing that sometimes you're fucking wrong because you everything changes. Exactly. <laughs> and I think that again, you know, not to constantly be going back to, you know, when I was young or younger people, right? It's funny. Like as you get older, you just constantly, you're like, wow, do I sound like You start doing that shit early though. But yeah. When I was 20, I was looking at 14 year olds like, God damn it. Yeah. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like what the fuck? Because you're looking at somebody and applying your knowledge of perspective to to them and they don't have it yet. Yeah, exactly. And and then you get older, even older as you go, that only intensifies because you have so many more perspectives. And if you're really paying attention you also have so many experiences where you've ended up with egg on your face, you yeah. know, and hopefully you learn from those. I know I have been so humbled by my own asinine opinions and oh, statements. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's you the know, next day where you're like, why the fuck did I say that? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't even like, you know. Yeah. Are you gonna, Yeah. And then you take it a step further. You're like, how did I, did I? I sounded like an asshole. Yeah, did or, I make that person feel like, did I make that person feel a certain way? I totally didn't even think yeah. about how they might have been feeling from their perspective. And um, it's I, it's an important skill to learn, I think, for your own self-development. But also it's an important thing when you work with people um, you know, or, or you just have relationships, right? And everybody has relationships. Mm-hmm. Just And in this business, we have... We, you know, you have your personal relationships and whatever your familial relationships may or may not be. And then you, you have your, your, your work relationships, which, in, you know, in this business, there's, you have them with your, your, uh, your coworkers, of course, right? Like your, and if you develop any kind of leadership uh, responsibilities, which almost everybody does, whether it's a, whether you have a title or not, there's always somebody new that eventually comes in yeah. that you, take a nurturing to or that you have to show the ropes Mm -hmm. or or technical skills or or just pass on information training you know or as you pass on up into the in you know into maybe even management or leadership and now that 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 tribe grows and you have even more people that you have to communicate and then you have you know sales people in front of the house and service related folks that that think you know that might have think one way and then you have uh cooks that might think another way then you have 
you know, then you have the guests mm-hmm. and then you have, which, which as a different perspective it's like Tetris. and then, yeah. And then you have vendors, right. And farmers, <laughs> you have farmers and then you have beverage people that have, you know, totally different, you know, they're doing the same thing kind yeah. of, but they, varying they, they might have care. varying levels of care, <laughs> yeah, varying yeah. levels of, of scope, you know, mm-hmm. and to really navigate, right. Like I always go back to the word navigate. Like I've been 2021 has made me hate the word pivot or 2020 has made me hate the word pivot. It's like, it's just like <laughs> navigate. Ear vomit. I'm like, and I, I just like, I'm like, yeah, I get it. Right. But like what I'm, what we're doing is navigating, right. We're like yeah. a boat at sea. There's a lot of things that we can't control. We're trying to pay attention to them and we're just trying to make adjustments, right? So that we can have our best, you know, our best chance at smooth sailing. Yeah. Uh, getting where we want to go, wherever mm-hmm. that may be. Yeah. Um, and with with people, it's like, again, you, you have all these micro experiences every day, like conversations, um, interactions, and I am like so insecure, like that I like constantly. I'm like replaying every conversation in my head. I'm like, yeah. How did I, did I get my point across? Did I sound like an asshole? Yeah. Did I did I sound like this? Did I make them feel? Did I evoke the right, you know, the feeling that I was trying to inspire or impart the knowledge that I that I was hoping to? Yeah. Did I learn something from that? Did like I, make, I just made a speech. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> like you know what I mean? those impromptu before yeah, service yeah. that get like way too philosophical. Yeah, like, and you're we're like, only doing forty guys. Yeah. It's like I do, you know, I'm not trying to solve anything here. I'm just like, yeah. oh, you're like yeah. oh you're like you know when you wake this, up in the morning. Is this thing on? Is this <laughs> yeah, thing yeah. on? You're like, <laughs> you're like I, just I give just, a soliloquy to yeah. the. Uh, yeah. there, there was no need for that. You know, uh, that's awesome. But you know, just to kind of bring that full circle back to like what you had mentioned was like I am constantly replaying all of those interactions and thinking about you know the way that I share my thoughts Mm -hmm. my beliefs my opinions and one of the things that can be really empowering is when you figure out how to express those without Mm-hmm. boxing somebody in or making them afraid to share their opinions if they're not the same thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's an that's important part of being a good listener, uh, being a good conversationalist, being a good, you know, partner in whatever kind of relationship that 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 is. Um, but also, like, you draw from, you know, we learn more from our mistakes than we do from our successes, right? Yeah. And, like, it's these sharper senses of, like, survival instincts and skills that kind of pop up and you're like, God, I shouldn't have said that. Or wow, I just watched how that unfolded yeah. or how this relationship disintegrated because of how I handled it or how we handled that together or mm. how we communicated or mm. didn't communicate in that relationship. And it makes you more sensitive to how you share your opinions or yeah. how you share your thoughts and belief system. Um, and you realize, you know, when you don't close when you're more careful, right? And we still all do it, I think, at varying levels. But when you're more careful not to put those definitive statements down, those ironclad like yeah. doors, is, yeah. you're open to learning. More, yeah, you know, and you're open to sharing more. And people are more likely to talk and share with you, which makes you able to continue to learn and grow and 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 become better absorb uh, yeah, yeah absorb and, and and it's hard when you're constantly putting doors down and we live in a in a in a time right now a really wild crazy time <laughs> yeah. where you know everyone has a platform right and i think that part is cool it's great um you know but we sort of uh not even sort of like so many people are losing the or never gaining the appreciation for the conversation, right? And it's like, yeah. or the opinion versus fact, right? And like, we live in a time where people can put this information out there and instantaneously it, it can reach infinite yeah. eyes, right? Yep. In, infinite, being infinite people's own browser, you know, like their own, in their own mind. And which again is so powerful it's so cool and resonant and there's so much good that has come and will come out of that uh but as we've seen from the last few years and how polarizing it can be when we forget how to speak to each other yeah, with, with empathy sure. and and care and how 
the lack of personal, actual physical, personally being in the space yeah. with the person that you're communicating allows you to be totally um, surgically removed from from how you're making somebody feel yeah. or the responsibility and weight of the, what your actions or sharing your opinions, you know, comes comes with. Yeah. You know, when you're sitting with somebody. You know, we're getting now to the point where people are so conditioned at not caring. Now they are actually acting, you know, they're, people are talking in the same way they tweet or the same it's, way they yeah. post, where it's like, <laughs> I, I don't care that you're right in front of me anymore. I'm just going to blurt out this thing. I don't care how it makes you feel. I'm not paying attention. Because, yeah, yeah. Because we have five second attention spans and we really do. And it's and it's crazy, you know. We're you know, and there's like this sort of unfortunate detachment from the connectivity. Yeah, you know, it's I mean, like which is like con- being connected. Being so connected has actually allowed us to remove mm-hmm. some of the important feelings from and and responsibilities from actually being being connected yeah. right and as I, I being present that, being present yeah right? because uh you know i think now uh we just get everything instant everything's instant instant it's instant so i mean instant. even those tiktok videos i was watching you know some the other day it's like instant 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 boom clip 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 you it's have a, it'll no, make your head spin you man. have no time like no. i don't like that shit you have yeah. no time it's to watch lot. it and you're like i can't i can't do this right it, now. it's intense you sort of have to be in the mood for it and you're like yeah if you're just like is this how we're gonna be like yeah is this, this is how we absorb information anymore you anymore. can't people can't they're literally like, you know, like this will be the longest conversation exactly. I have, right? Because you're like, people are, people are like, you sit down and, and literally two seconds into the conversation, they pick up the phone yep. and they're just like, oh yeah, I'm listening, but I'm also scrolling. I'm guilty of it too. Yeah. Like, and I try to be more mindful of it now. Yeah. Like, again, cause like, I'm, you know, I'm constantly trying to learn and get better and pay more attention to myself, you know, and it's, I, I'm a big believer in example leading by example but also just trying to be my best self yeah. you know and that's a constant journey that's a constant work in progress and i don't want to expect things from others that i don't aren't aware of in my own self yeah. or my own you know who i am and and sometimes i want to challenge my own my own assumptions and beliefs like yeah in terms of like i want to see how those if i do that myself and will i is that something i actually think is right or is that just something i you know is that just a hot like take that i just kind of latched on and said that maybe that'll work and then i yeah. just start putting it out there no like let me let me work through that let me try to see if that's something that is a is a thing you know mm-hmm. that i want that i want to do and um so i try to be more self-aware now of it because i, I found myself doing it or yeah. i found myself getting aggravated or annoyed or or like hurt right like we're so sensitive in this yeah, business true. right Chefs um, are the most so fucking sensitive, sensitive people right? ever, man. So sensitive, right? Like... And <laughs> because we because we have to be to, yeah, be good, at, be, yeah. to be good at this, be. right? Like we're, you're honing whether you know how to rein it in or how to harness you're everyone's it. Everyone's mom, like you know, <laughs> everybody's mom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're feeding you. Yeah, we're trying to make sure you're 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 warm when you're cooled. You're cool when you're warm. That you're you know you get drinks when you're thirsty. That that again, like back to what we were saying in the beginning. That you know, is the light making you comfortable? Is that seat nice? Do you do you like the way this place makes you feel? Yeah. Do you, you know, let me take care of you. Like we're constantly trying to bring somebody in yeah. from the cold and and make them feel better. So you hone all your senses, whether it's intentional or not, mm-hmm. into yeah. like being attuned to all that stimuli out there which is really almost impossible at least for me to shut off like when in your go outside true, in your yeah. regular life yeah. and you're like you're picking things up that other people aren't seeing and you're taking them personally or yeah, you're taking them sure. sensitive and i'm gonna take a bathroom break real quick oh, is hell that yeah. Okay? yeah that's fine pause this shit yeah I gotta take a, I drink all righty Bathroom break is over, you know? <laughs> We're real here on, on Sucio Talk. It's all good. The one day I was uh, filming in Oakland and like some siren went off. And he's like, you want to like turn it off? I was like, no, fuck no. <laughs> Just let it play. Let it let the siren play. It's all good. It's, all... it's you know? part of life, right? It's like, that's, I think that's one of the coolest things about like your podcast is you just like, this is a snapshot, you know? Yeah. This is 
a real snapshot, yeah. right? And roll, roll with the punches. Fuck it. Authentic in all its, you know, in in all its capturing, right? Mm-hmm. And I look at that, you know, that that's sort of where I'm at in, in my life, and especially with this last year, it's just looking at things and saying like, how do I, how do I be like authentically just where I need to be and who I need to be and just yeah. capture where I'm at and where we're at right now, you know, and what's how does the right that, thing to do? What's the right thing to do? Have you ever thought do? about writing a cookbook or anything? Oh yeah. God, I think about, I've thought about that so many times over the years. It's definitely on my list. I've even start, I've even, I've even started writing a couple times over the, over the years. Yeah. Um, and then I've stopped, I've started and stopped, started and yeah. stopped. And because of, so many reasons the grind of the time commitment yeah um, and your dad chef you know that's, yeah that's like yeah it's, 22 hours of the day yeah gone. yeah and um and just the the roller coaster ride of the last 20 you know 20 years 22 years and but that's something that i know i'm gonna do i've contributed to a few um yeah. over the years um and it's a it's a passion thing, and I guess I go back and forth to like, okay, now I need to like just have a concept, or do I just do recipes, or do I just do like a okay, Nick's over the years, do I do a, you know, what, what is it going to be? And sometimes, and this is something I'm actually consciously working on right now, like it's like you become so dialed into trying to make things perfect that you. Never do it. You never do it because now you're worried yeah. about making your process perfect. Yep. That was the reason why, you know, a lot of, when I started this podcast, a lot of people were like, oh, you should do video. And it's like, I don't like, that would require me another two weeks of like getting a fucking camera and figuring it out. And then it's like, now my show has this base where it's like, he needs a camera now, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. I have everything in a fucking backpack for this reason. I can record and go anywhere, yeah. and, you know, do yeah. whatever. Um, and so I just had to start it. And the, the first one, the audio sucked. You yeah. could hear the cars, you know, riding in the street outside and shit. And uh, I just had to do it because I knew that if I mm-hmm. did it mm-hmm. and then didn't do another one, people would be like, that's fucking lame. You know, so I put the pressure on myself. I was like, I'm going to put this podcast out there and I'm going to say, I'm doing a podcast. Yeah. So I never said publicly, I'm going to do this podcast until I had one. Yeah. And then I was like, here's the fucking podcast. Yeah. That's it. Which was smart. Yeah. But then it also, (laughs) you know, you laid the gauntlet down for yourself. Oh, I did. Which is because we're, we're total. I like deadlines. Yes. And in, in this business, again, you're like, did we gravitate towards it because that's how we were? Or did this business make us like that? Probably a little bit of both, you know, where we, like you like deadlines and you need pressure, right? Like you need pressure, pressure fuels the yeah. creativity, right? Creativity, yeah. And because sometimes I sit there and I'm like, I'm going to think of a dish. And I'm like, I, nothing you can't comes. Think, right. But no. if you're like, if you're I got to cook for, I, yeah, I got to cook for four people <laughs> yeah. or, or like shit, there's like these, these chicken legs need to get used. Yeah. Like, what can I do? What can I do with them? Boom. And then all of a sudden, all these creative ideas mm-hmm. come, right? And it's funny because you know, you hear that quote over and over again over the years, like necessity is the mother of all invention, yeah. right? And it's so true, right? It's like there's this adrenaline and this mental like fortitude that comes out of need, mm-hmm. right? Um, where you're able to, it just, whether you're able to just laser focus on something or just percolate ideas and action, right? That it's hard to... It's hard to once you've felt and harnessed that that level of pressure. It's hard to put yourself in that space without 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 the pressure. The pressure. Without yeah, the pressure. I hear you. That's that's the the cool thing, and I think that's why I did this podcast because you know I knew that my time in Charter Oak was coming to an end, mm-hmm. and I was like, I need a I need a grind. Mm-hmm. I need to know that at least I have something to go into that you know doesn't make me any money, but still keeps me busy. 
And like, you don't even fathom how busy you get doing this shit, mm-hmm. you know? Because you're like, oh yeah, it's a it's a fucking podcast, but it's like, no, okay, now you got to record it, now you got to you know take the right photos, say the right things, schedule things, yeah, to, you know, exactly. Outreach. People got wives and kids yeah. and like, Businesses you know, they're probably right. like, who the fuck is David? I don't. You're like, don't, I don't want you doing fucking podcasts. What the fuck? You know what I mean? It's like, you gotta be a dad out here. You got time for this, you know? So I take into account all those things and I'm never like hurt if somebody can't mm-hmm. do it or, mm-hmm. you know, cause I get it, you mm-hmm. know? And, and, uh, I was actually talking to this chef from LA, uh, Joe Sasto and he, you know, I asked him over Instagram, I was like, Hey, you want to do the podcast? And he was like, super appreciative. He's like, yeah, let's, let's fucking do it. And he's like, you know, when can you do it? And I was like, seriously, dude, if you say let's do it at four in the morning at my restaurant, I'll do it at four in the morning at your fucking restaurant. Like, I'm all in here. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like cooking. You're all in. Yeah. If you got to get up at four in the morning and go get your chickens to have an, for service, then that's what you're and fucking that's what doing. You, do. that's you what know, you do. so I think that working in the chef field definitely gives you uh, strength. In other parts mm-hmm. of your life where you're like, all right, organization, fucking hold yourself accountable. So I'm definitely glad I picked this field. <laughs> but the, yeah, the flip side, right, is just that like when the pressure dials down and you're left like with yourself or with the time and you only have that one thing to do. Yeah. And not the 10 things to do. You're like, do I... <laughs> How do I how do I just do the one thing? Can I can I sit with myself and focus on this one yeah. thing? And um, can I not feel worthless I, doing less? Yeah, you know? yeah, and which is a big struggle, especially yeah. I think now um, over everything that's happened over the last year. Yeah, and uh, it's just like how do we how do we be okay with changing, Stop. adapting, doing <laughs> less, stopping? Yeah. Uh, how did you ever have any injuries over in your career? Like the injuries I, I, that took you out of the kitchen for a while. Um, when I was uh, a, when I was a, I think what was I then? I, I don't know if I was the sous chef yet, but um, I think it was a like the lead a lead cook at at the Agora, and I got third degree burns on my hands mm-hmm. um, from a from hot oil and a cast iron skillet. Uh. And uh, that took me out for a couple weeks um, because you know my the skin was melted off yeah. my hand, and they they wouldn't let me work. Uh, it was pretty pretty gnarly. Um, I want to say that's I mean that might be it. Last I mean two years ago was it two years ago or a year and a half ago? My appendix, <laughs> my appendix. Oh my god. Uh, almost exploded so that took me out for a couple weeks yeah for sure um and then actually yeah and then a few years back um i you know i my i developed a like a cyst on my vocal cords oh wow and I had was that have, just from talking I had so much surgery just from like I doing mean, it was, it was a like... combination of a, a combination of like fatigue and abuse of like my not sleeping enough. Yeah. You know, it was hot. not sleeping enough. Burning the candle Train- both ends. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was super stressful times at work, a lot of yelling and screaming and, you know, barking out orders and, you know, expoing at like really high- not being self aware of what I was doing to my own voice self, yeah. and my own self, not sleeping, not resting, drinking highly acidic stuff all the time, coffee, you know, alcohol, um, high acid foods, um, to the point, and then also s- singing. Right, I'm, I like I'm a musician as well. And yeah, like, and then singing on top of it, and not really paying attention to how I was using my voice. And yeah, all of those things like together, um, just created, you know, created like these these uh, cysts on my vocal cord, and um, I could ho- I could hardly talk. Okay, and I start, started off thinking it was just laryngitis. And, but it lasted like for months. And then I literally, there were like frequencies where I would, no noise would come out of my mouth. Like and you, you could, were talking? Yeah. You thought you were talking yeah. and, and nothing you, would come out. And it's like, and it was just crazy and scary at the same time because I was like, my voice was like something, I'm like, I kind of need this. Yeah. And um, I had to have surgery 
and uh, I've actually had to have that surgery twice. Whoa. Um, yeah. I asked because um, I know when I got injured and when you're out of the kitchen, mm-hmm. you immediately feel worthless. Totally. You immediately yeah. feel like, totally. wow, like all this could be dashed away quickly. And it makes you appreciate it more. And it works two ways. It helps you reflect during the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you kind of make these false promises to yourself when mm-hmm. you're really in it. When you're like, I'm going to take more time off. Like, this is great. I have time to think. And then half the other half of you, the chef part of you is like, well, you got to fucking make this time up. You got to get in there and like, you got to manage shit. And, you know what I mean? So it's like your, your body even then is like still um, fighting itself. And I sometimes I don't think that a two week vacation is enough. No, it's really not. You know, it's, it's not to truly know. relax. You, you, you know, it's like you have the bends still at that point. You haven't decompressed Mm-hmm. enough like you're literally at that point you're just starting to decompress you yeah. haven't began to actually like you've just started to relax right like and like when we close whenever we've closed even for like a week to me that's like that's like i means i'm gonna get one or two days off right in the middle yeah because it's like takes three days to turn down three or four days to rev up yeah and then you're like okay i've got like a day or two i've got a weekend in the middle of that or whatever that is and if it's two weeks you're like okay like i'm gonna get like maybe four or five days you know it takes two weeks to get like for a weekend you know yeah. three a days weekend of, of time actual rest and even when you when you're working in the restaurant you get home you're not going to sleep you can't you're it's, sleeping but you you know what i mean you're yeah. you're, you're you're jerking you're waking up you're yeah. checking your phone you're thinking about that stock you left on the exactly. stove. Exactly. Is did my I place restaurant going to burn did down? Did I place that order? Did I place that order? It's yeah. hard. To, it's hard to detune, and I think that's an important part of that. I'm learning, you know, again, like every day and every week to try to do better, like for my own mental health and for the yeah. well-being of myself and my family, and like is to like how do you decompress? How do you turn down? And how do you? Come sort back of up. come back yeah. up in a in a healthy and mindful way where mm-hmm. you're like I'm not like an asshole to be around. I'm not a stress ball. Like I'm not taking out my anxieties from X, Y, and Z on ABC. You yeah. know? Um and you know it's a daily it's a daily process. Like, it really is. Um just trying to just trying to do that. But like but just being mindful that you do need that mm-hmm. that time and whether you come home at five o'clock or whether you come home at 10 o'clock or, or 1 a.m like you you need some time to just decompress and slow let, down, it, let right? it let it slow down right it's like when you're working out and they tell you to do a wind down or a slow down like you know if you're running and they're like okay now just take a couple of laps or two minutes and just walk and like just yeah decompress right like just like I feel like the the nature of chefs is fight or flight and we don't know how to decompress no it's like Ready, go. What do you do when all stop. the guys stop? <laughs> it's yeah. a boom, boom, boom. It's like a fucking banquet service mm-hmm. every day mm-hmm. for our minds and souls. And, and uh, yeah, you to- just don't stop. Totally. And you don't stop. And then when you do stop, you're sort of just waiting for it. To the, start up again. To start yeah. up again. It's like a so, drug. Yeah. It really is. And you, know? and, you, and you have to get used to that. Like, how do I live in that space between and not be just waiting for it to be over? Yeah. Right? Because that's... That's my time, mm-hmm. you know, and I have to make the most of that. You, you know, know, I see it sometimes. I see it all the time. I was uh, was at LL Bean yesterday, mm-hmm. I was looking for turtle turtlenecks out there. If anybody got any any, <laughs> <laughs> You're bringing any them recommendations, back. You're bringing them back. I'm bringing them back, baby. You know, the turtleneck deserves respect. And then people are like, <laughs> "Oh yeah, Steve Jobs." Like, fuck Steve Jobs, right? This is Shaft. <laughs> all right, Shaft inspired this shit. Uh, Just so you know. Uh, so I look over at this guy and he's, he's, he works there and he's like, he's checking his watch constantly and he doesn't have a smart watch. So he's just looking at, at the time. Yeah. And I'm like, I remember back to having those jobs that you're just looking at the time ready to go. And that is what makes me appreciate all of the struggle and being in fight or flight all the time and, and ha- not sleeping, you know, it like justifies it all for me. Yeah. Like I would rather fucking be this than be 
working somewhere where I'm looking at my watch being like, when do I get out of here? When, when, when am I free? You know, but I think that there is also a freedom in that and being like, there is work is work and home is home there is. and you don't mix it. There, there is. And, um, and who's to say which is better? I know the younger me would be like, oh, yeah, this is definitely better. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. I have a purpose. <laughs> you know, I have a purpose. And then that guy's looking at you going, but you're also an asshole. Cause exactly. What do you do for fun? When, how much time do you actually get to, do you get to read? Do you get to see your family? See your family? Do you have days off? Do yep. you know, do you, what's your health like? What's your, what's your sleep like? Yep. You know, and you're like, yeah, you know, and you realize, it's not necessarily, again, like going back to what you were saying earlier, it's like about your opinions and your preconditions and your like of, 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 of your perception. And like, well, it's not right or wrong. It's just what is and what isn't. Yeah. Right? Like, and it's just, they're just cause and effect. It's just action reaction, right? Like, but that doesn't make my action or my reaction or his action reaction right or wrong. It's just, it's just there and it's there for us to decide what version do we want or what, what amalgamation of those things do we want to be our reality or our life or our perspective. And, and, and I think so much of, so many of us in this industry, especially um, now more than, more than ever are sharing, you know, our frailties and our experiences in a way where we don't, where we can talk about what you know we we we've idolized and lived the lifestyle and the and you know recreated what we thought we were supposed to do and how we were supposed to do this and now we're you know we're just we've been living with the okay like I'm going to make $200 a week for five years before I have a chance to make, yeah, you know, like this, or I'm going to do this and then I'm going to work 60 hours uh, a week or 80 hours a week or 90 hours a week or a hundred hours a week. And when I reach a hundred hours a week, I really made it, you know, like I'm really yeah. doing this. Yeah. Right. And then you're like, and then your, your health sucks. Your life sucks. You've alienated yeah. yourself from your family. You don't even get invited to things anymore because people know you're not going to show up. You're not going to show up. Yeah. Um, cause even and, on the, I remember Christmas, I looked at it as the, the best day because nobody calls you. Like I had like over the course of my career, yeah. I looked at it as a day like, where I'm not going to, I'm going to go to my... sleep and I don't have to talk to anybody. Right. You know, because my family one, you know, probably thinks I'm working and my work people are off. So mm-hmm. there's <laughs> nothing going mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I would find solace in Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yeah. It's like, that's the only day where everything's kind of shut off. Yeah. That's you know? quiet and, and, and chill. And you're like, is that the way? You know, is yeah. that the is that, is the, that right the right way, thing right? to be doing? Is it right yes. to be like somebody to be like like a you know to think about a career in our field as with at the same arc as like professional sports or yeah. or or like high intensity military? It really is right where you're like you got a shelf life, man. Mm-hmm. You got a shelf life because you can't go at that pace without, all the time, all the forever. Right. Yeah. And, or you can't live that kind of life either physically, mentally, emotionally forever. Or if you can, then you're not going to have any of these other things be healthy or in balance yep. as well. And we're really, I don't think that all of those things that have been unknown, but I think we're in a place now where we can talk about we can it. Talk about it without, without, be, being, without, like, being, hey, without being questioned. <laughs> yeah. Without being, <laughs> yeah. Without being demasculated yeah. or without feeling like a failure yeah. or, Without feeling like you're exposing, you know, uh, truths that you're supposed to just you're just supposed to live, and yeah. um, and I think that's one of the really good things and beautiful things that's coming out of uh, our more modern time. Um, do some people take it to the extreme? Yeah, like absolutely. But I think it's important that we're able to share these things because I, you know, I do enjoy this work, right? And I do want to do it for a while. I have other things I want to do also, but I don't want to grow to hate this. You know, there's been times over the years where I have, I've like gotten out of bed and it's like, I go to put my feet on the floor and they hurt, you know, and they just like, 
fuck this today. Yeah, just like yeah. I just and you have don't no fucking choice want to do <laughs> you this know? today, you know. And like, and I'm like, God, like, yeah, you can't flip it like a light switch, but I don't want to be in this headspace. Like, this yeah. isn't healthy. Like, I need to stop doing this if that's where I'm gonna if that's where I'm gonna be. Exactly. Like, and I've certainly had that plateau a few times yeah. over the over the last. 20 something years. That's a good but, plateau to talk about because yeah. a lot of uh, young chefs, that happens to them all the fucking time. Literally yeah. every time they have a bad service, they go yeah. home and question their whole existence. Yeah. Yes. And and that's sort of like where you're... And I think there's part of that process that's healthy. Oh, for but sure. But then there's also part of that where you're just like, dude, man, you've been doing this for a year and a half. Like, you're yeah. not... Like, you got to give it some time. Give it some you time, know, yeah. You haven't... You haven't. You don't have the muscle memory built in. You don't have the technical skills yet. You yeah. don't have all these things. Like a little bit of you know, just because we're talking about these really heavy, heavy, physically, mentally, emotionally challenging things, every time you don't get what you want, or the world pushes back on you just a little bit, doesn't mean that that is like, you know, so intense. Every every time you don't get what you want or you don't feel the way you want, that's just that can also just be work and something that exactly you, something that you that have to through. that you have yeah. to work through, right? Yeah. Like we can't be so adverse to adversity that we that we are like it's growing pains that yeah that's all that we're is. just afraid to put the work in, right? Yeah. And I'm not certainly not like advocating for you know that like boot camp style intensive you know abusive or anything like that but on the flip side you know i we can't be afraid to get to get to work you exactly. know and like and yeah. we can't be afraid of adversity because that's what that's what hones and forges yeah. us and makes us makes us stronger um and you know if we lived in a world like how would you develop like we, we go back to like the creative process right and and just becoming our better selves like all of these things come out of these even adversities that you put on yourself they come out of out of these situations where you where you have to kind of check yourself or feel like wow like shit i fucked that up man yeah oh, i gotta do that better yeah, right and like you need that, those yeah. you just need those things and um i hope that we can learn as we as everything changes and everyone changes um, that people can like handle adversity mm -hmm. um, without giving up, you know, yeah. and, like at least, and you know, if you want to change directions, change careers, change, you know, mindsets, lifestyles, that's the beauty of this life and yeah. world is that you can do that and you're empowered to do that. Right. But also, you know, if, if you really think you want to try something, whether it's cooking or serving or, or you know, or carpentry or music or wh whatever that thing is, like, yeah. don't be afraid to work at it. Yeah, either, exactly. You know, and don't give up on that after that little bit or, or big bits of it's adversity, true. you know. It's like, you know, trying to learn guitar, going to one lesson and being like, ah, I didn't get it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> just, it's just, it's just up, not for you know? me, man. Like, I just can't do, my hands don't bend that exactly. way. Exactly. You know? like, You're like, I just can't do it. And I think that, you know, I think uh, when, you, when you're when you growing, uh, part of it is you telling yourself, you're wrong. Yeah. I can do this. I can do this. You know? I can um, do this. Part of, you know, I was, when I talked to Jason McKinney on one of the episodes, he talks about kind of talking with yourself mm -hmm. and how to do that successfully. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes you do have to like sit yourself down and be like, you know, you were wrong to say that you couldn't do the thing. Mm -hmm. You just didn't work hard at it. Mm -hmm. And just because you failed the first time doesn't mean, you know, just like all the greats have the stories of people being homeless that are now millionaires or yeah. Michael Jordan getting cut from his team. And now he's the best. Yeah. It's like, you know, so the human, uh, you know, the human mind is a powerful thing. And I think we're seeing now more than ever. And that's, I think, the beauty of social media is that everything's out there when these huge triumphs that mm -hmm. people have overcome mm -hmm. 20, 30 years in the making mm -hmm. that back in 1992, whoever was going through these struggles didn't fucking think yeah. at all that anybody would know what the hell's going on, you know? Um, but I don't think back in 1992, they were putting Gorilla Glue in their hair. <laughs> have you seen that shit? <laughs> no. That some chick put fucking Gorilla Glue in her hair and like she's been in the hospital for days. They've been like oh, washing it out man. of her scalp. <laughs> and then you know, you know people, was that a TikTok video? That was, uh, I think she tried to make a video, like, you know, those hair videos. She like tried to make it like a, 
whatever styling video and she's like check it out like my hair hasn't moved in a couple days and she was gorilla glue and then now it's like all over the news she's got to go fund me she's been in the hospital for days getting her fucking hair torn off of her head but you know humans you know they learn from others mistake as well that's the lesson there you know what i mean that's something that (laughs) read the labels guys read the fucking labels (laughs) jesus you know i mean it's funny i uh, I ordered uh, mustard oil um this past year from Amazon, because when we came back to being open, mm-hmm. everybody had started to home cook, home bake, mm-hmm. like, you know, flour was hard to find, mm-hmm. sugar was low, mm-hmm. yeast was low, mm-hmm. and you're like, what the fuck is happening, <laughs> you know? And um, I forgot where the fuck I was going with that story. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Mustard oil. Mustard oil. So, um, I think that edible's starting to hit. <laughs> <laughs> So the mustard oil, I get it. And I'm like, oh, great. We got mustard oil. We can make mustard vinaigrette. We're good. And I look at the label. It's like only for hair and skin. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> so, you know, what did I do? I put it in a shot glass. I drank a little bit of it. And then let me wait a day and see if I die. Yeah. You know, I didn't die. But then I was still like, I'm, I, I, can't, can't, I can't. I can't look, I just, you know, I can't do it. I can't. Yeah, I can't. No. Because, you know, somebody's going to get sick. And it's like, that's the yeah. last thing you want. The worst thing i think is for you to make a mistake and to find out years later that you made a mistake yeah you know Uh, and be like oh yeah remember that time you came and cooked thanksgiving dinner for us we all got sick nobody told you because they felt bad (laughs) that kind of shit you know i never lived that but i'm sure somebody has and it's rough but um so you're in rhode island let's get back to to your life here go for it you're in rhode island you're growing up uh when did you first kind of get interested in food for me you know, when I look back, when I was younger, it didn't seem like it was anything in particularly important to me. But when I look back now, it was always important to me, right? Yeah. When, I, when I was able to, like, you later see? on in my life, even in my teens, and when I decided to do this for, for a career, I look back and I'm like, no, this has been with you. You see the signs. From, from like, you just didn't know what was happening. Yeah. But like, you know, I'm the youngest of five and my mom is one of seven. Um, and we live close to my grandparents and so many of my fond memories as a child were like revolved around the kitchen around around the dinner table mm-hmm. revolved around these social gatherings sunday suppers at grandpa's house yeah. where like he would have all his kids and they would have all their kids and and it was just these like crazy experiences and i wasn't thinking about the food but the food was what brought everybody there yeah. and when i look back right it was the meal and the dinner table right that just created that feeling mm-hmm. and as I got, you know, a little bit older, I just, I remember just loving, oh, I love the way that tastes, the way grandpa makes this, or I love the way mom makes this. What kind or, of food are we talking here? Uh, you know, like, it was never anything super special. So we, you know, my, my background is uh, Irish, French, um, and Sicilian, which is a whole other crazy story. Um, <laughs> but... We grew up very much like my grandfather, my, my my grandfather's family and my mom's side came down from uh, Quebec, Montreal, like, and my grandmother, my, my dad's side also, uh, you know, my meme and like, so there's like French Canadian on both sides. Um, so that, that definitely, whether they knew it at the time, but like, you know, they were cooking with their parents that cooked for them and so forth and so on. So I got a lot of that influence in my in my family meals, but also my grandmother, you know, very, very Irish. Uh, you know, there was some, there was a lot of sense of those sensibilities that again, I only saw later in life that when maybe that's where that came from. Yeah. Um, but you know, my grandfather used to do, uh, cream chicken. He used to make these, uh, like make these whole like chickens and like, just awesome like just black pepper and milk like sauce over mashed potatoes or like we Mm. were constantly having like gravies or sauces over like you know which i know now was like old bread and things like that or um but we also you know 
a lot of, um, you know, he would make sausage and peppers a lot when I was a kid. Uh, eggplant Parmesan in the summertime when eggplants were around, like things, you know, they were, they were, it was a diverse group of like foods, but there were certainly, you know, the roasts, ham dinners, mm-hmm. like things like, you know, and, and s- simple stuff. It wasn't complicated, but it just always tasted yeah. so good. It sounds you know? like it's a little seasonal. Yeah. You said when I, yeah, there were, were ready, some, so he... there were definitely some, you know, the, some elements. Um, and I'm sure that changed as time went by because of how accessible everything yeah, got, yeah. but still their thought process and their patterns were, de- were sort of developed before those, the, those um, abilities came out. So mm-hmm. like, you know, they're thinking about things or they had gardens or they grew up when there was gardens. So they, when the weather was a certain way, they kind of they know wanted what, a certain yeah. thing, you know, and like, uh, and my mom was great is, is, a, is she still is a great cook. And when I was a kid, you know, there was, she, there was five of us and my dad was working his ass off and, and my mom was raising us and, yeah. and we were, you know, she would just, cooking it was like she was cooking for an army every day like you know three meals a day for seven people she used to bake bread when i was younger before she started work going to work and those things just really stuck with me and plus you know i had three older i had three teenage sisters that were that were like i was constantly hiding from and Mm -hmm. i would like just go hang out with my mom in the kitchen, you know, or like when I was real little, I would just like play under the kitchen table, yeah. like, you know, and the sights, the smells, the hum, the buzz in there. And, um, then I just actually, one of the first meals that I physically started cooking, you know, my dad worked as he worked so much when I was a kid and he'd two, three jobs. And, um, but on Sundays, sometimes he would make breakfast and, he taught me how to make like home fries, you know, and like, he taught me how to make like, you know, we call them flapjacks growing up, which yeah. I later found out were crepes, you know, yeah. like, but that's what just what, you know, that's what they called them when he was growing up and he would make crepes or my mom would make crepes and um, we'd have flapjacks and there'd be, you know, there'd be like on a Sunday morning, there'd be five, you know, seven of us, five of us, five kids, like all around this table on and, you know, these, they're, they got two pans going and they're just, you know, making one, throwing it on one and you'd have yeah. to go in order and you'd be waiting for yours to come That's around. The best. And, and it was just like hot so, pancakes. it was so yeah. cool. And like, you know, you didn't know, I didn't know what was happening, you know, but like then as life got harder, my parents, you know, ended up getting divorced and, you know, you were, as a teenager and you're going through all the teenage yeah, things yeah. and emotions and the world was not, you know, my brother was getting I, I, uh, what year was deployed this? to like, this is like early nineties, you yeah. know, mid early nineties. My brother was getting deployed to uh, the Gulf yeah. and like, you know, all these like crazy emotions and things going on. And, um, you just like, you get in that teenage headspace and weird. And like, you start to look for your, you know, your blankie, you know, your comfort. Like, yeah. what are you things that like, make you feel good and and also just out of a need again like my mom was working now and like so i'd be like have to fend for myself after school yeah. or like uh you know and i'd start like just like i'm just gonna make myself some whatever you mm-hmm. know like when I started off heating up leftovers or then just making myself breakfast yeah. and and i you know then sometimes like my in my one of my buddies who who's really funny uh told this story on air he was you know back in in college he was a he was a uh, um uh, a dj on uh-huh. on uh, for bru and i had lost touch with him for a few years and he was telling this and then i'm i didn't even know he was like a dj on on this radio station yeah. and i'm driving to work and i used to listen to bru all the time and and i hear this story and i about like Oh, my buddy was little, you know, he used to, we used to make, he used to make jiffy muffins and he was telling this crazy story about, and I'm like, he's like, I'm like, is that Matt? Is that Matt? And I call the radio station and it was like, my buddy was like telling this funny story <laughs> about how his buddy, how his buddy was like shit. cooking when they were kid when we were kids and like, and I'm laughing and I'm like, 
God, yeah, I guess like hearing it from somebody else, I'm like, I guess I, I just, yeah, I'm like, hey, hey, you know, and I, I like we were like playing and like do you know i'm like yeah let's let's go make some muffins or cookies or like i was like cooking when i was like you know like a young kid and like and i'm not to say that i'm not the only like the only person that would do that but like it was just something that i like to do Mm -hmm. you know and it was something that made me happy and i wanted to eat and i wanted to make things delicious i'm like oh like the batter is it's this but we can we can throw x this we can throw let's chop up some yeah let's chop some stuff in there let's do some stuff and it was just funny to hear like that story through someone else's lens, yeah. you know, and and there were so many of those things. And I can remember being at parties when I was like, you know, the morning after a party and be like, are you guys hungry? Like, it's like, I'll make some stuff, you know, like having sleepovers and things like that. And it was just something I always did. But more importantly, it was something that like it was a, it was like a skill set that I developed out of a need but also out of a passion out of a comfort that reminded me of those sunday suppers even after they faded away after my grandparents moved and and got too old to do it like it reminded me of that that time and that feeling Mm -hmm. you know that had and the power of that communal dinner table of like just you know if you make a meal and you're able to share it with people Mm -hmm. like it's sustenance it's comfortable it's 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 just this warm feeling inside whether you're cooking and serving people and making them happy because it's delicious or because they need it or because you want to share a conversation or yeah. it's the reason that people it's the glue that hold people together and it was something that again as life got harder it wasn't what i intended to do for a career path uh but then i got you know when i was 13 or 14 so many of us i think have the story like my sister had a friend whose brother was a chef and, and the sister also worked at this, you know, I, I think, I don't know if she was a cook or, or a wait, wait, or a bartender. I can't remember, but at this, at Gus's Red Tavern in Barville and, and the, you know, the brother must have called her. She's like, you know, the dishwasher or something, the dishwasher didn't show up or yeah, yeah. quit or something, a fire. I can't remember what it was. Do you know any, you know, can, can you find somebody to wash dishes, you know, and, my sister, she asked my sister, my sister asked me, you know, do you want to make some money? You want to go wash dishes? And we didn't, ha- you know, there wasn't money, you know, a, lo- a lot of money yeah. for us going up. And you were up. like, my I, own money? Fuck and me. I was like, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I went in, washed dishes, you know, like for the night. And that was it. You know, that was like my first voyage on the pirate ship. Yeah, and you just looking was over like, at the pirates, and you're like, "These motherfuckers are hard." I was like, this is fucking crazy, <laughs> you know, swearing, screaming, like everything you like, a, like a page out of Kitchen yeah, Confidential, yeah, yeah. you know, like where you're just like, "This is scaring the shit out of me," and I love it, yeah. like you know, like this is crazy. It's like I'm in an action movie, like, and I. And it was just, and I'm going to get paid for it. And it was yeah. hard and it stunk and it was like gross. And, but you just like, you're like, do I hate it? Do I like it? Do I hate it? Do I like it? I'm going to get paid. Like, yeah. you're gonna, oh, I get to eat something. You're going to make me something to eat or I can taste things. I can like, there was like the sense of freedom that came with like getting a job. And mm-hmm. then like also just being out of the house and being on my own and mom would drop me off or my sister would drop me off and pick me up. And, um, that was the first, you know, bite into the like professional world. And I I never thought I would do it. You know, I was like, that was like, I was really thinking like math, science, service. Like, you know, I come from a, like a military family and so many of my, like my dad, my brother, my grandparents, uh, my grandfather's, uh, all served uh it was my uncles a bunch of my uncles not all of them but and it was something that i, I thought about right mm-hmm. and i was applying i was thinking of going to west point i had this like career arc and path that i was thinking maybe i'll do fbi or cia or you know like i, I don't know like we're going to politics like it was just like a different totally different trajectory yeah <clears throat> and that changed like very late in my senior year in high school and i just fuck it like and i for so many reasons it was more complicated than that but i decided you know to go as to my fallback and go into cooking Mm -hmm. 
And I went to Johnson Wales and, you know, the rest is sort of history. <laughs> uh, we're going to get into that history. But before that, what music were you listening to in the early 90s? Oh, man. I know that music I was, was a strong, getting oh, really strong at that point. Oh, yeah. I was definitely... So I come... I have a unique background being the youngest of five kids. Uh-huh. So I had a really crazy musical upbringing. Um, can I stop for one second? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Let's do it. It's all good. It's all good though. That's why. It's why I live. That's. That's why we. There's no more. This is no longer a, t- a, t- a three family house. It's like I can't. I can't yeah, be. roommates are fucking horrible. Oh. I'm sorry. Sorry for all you roommates out there that get along, but oh, for the most man. part, it turns shitty. Um. So we're in your life. We're in Rhode Island. You're yeah, about 13, we're 14. Start, yeah. We're listen to music. About music. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, man, music has always been a huge part of my life. Uh, when I was a kid, we had, um, you know, we had an eight-track player. Yeah. We had a record player. You know, we had cassettes. What kind C- of records? Um, you know, there. that was like right at the tail end of like where it didn't get used a lot. Like, yeah. As I can remember, um, that was... And the, and the eight tracks, like we, when I was real little, I remember the eight track cassettes. And then right as where my memory really starts to kick in is, you know, when cassettes became a big thing. Mm-hmm. And, but when I was a kid, man, like we, Elvis, I was so into like Elvis and my first cassette, uh, eight track was, was actually a, uh, a country guy named Boxcar Willie. Uh, I remember that and, boxcar Willie. Yeah, man. And my my parents listened to a really diverse like kind of group of music, and and uh, yeah, I remember a lot of the seventies stuff. They were still playing like everything from you know Kenny Rogers to like to Stevie Wonder, and you know all everything in between, Bee Gees and uh, my my the Beatles uh, my brother who was the oldest and I'm the youngest as I was a kid was like really into like 80s um, um, the Cars uh, Devo Journey um, my sister um, who had a huge impact like not the next one but the next one uh, share and uh, she she listened to a lot. Of, she was super into sixties and seventies rock. Yeah, Zeppelin, um, Bad Company, uh, Aerosmith, and I really got a lot of that from her. Uh, but mom, you know, would always Sundays were, you know, we'd have breakfast. We might we'll go to church, come back. And then it was mom would put on Casey Case and Top Forty, and we would everybody would do chores and like clean and clean the house and do stuff around the house. So the Top Forties on Sundays were like a huge impact mm-hmm. on me, like like just like Sunday suppers and pop music was a you know just so much so many different artists in different styles. Um, but then as I got a little older and it became a teenager. I was really into uh, hip hop, like early hip hop a lot and like tribe and uh, man. Uh, then around, I would say 92, I was still listening to like a lot of hip hop and pop and, but I just got really into like, that was, into rock and grunge and mm-hmm. um that was that just became like everything to yeah. me in my world and the angst and you know i was a teenager i was dealing with all these emotions my parents were getting divorced you know it's going to high school and dealing like with that exactly whole, what like, the fuck these guys were talking yeah, about yeah it was everything it was everything <laughs> they were talking about yeah and uh and sonically it just like it just resonated with me the guitar the voices uh, the words you know mm-hmm. I was, oh, i've always been a writer you know okay. and like and words to me, like I have a hard time, especially that at that time. And like, it was just like, if, if I heard the, like, if the words weren't substantive to me, like I, 
I just couldn't get into you it. You couldn't yeah. get into it, gotcha. You know, and like, um, I was always, and I was looking for that. I was looking for something to make me feel either uh, recognized, recognized yeah. or, uh, or, or just feel good or feel like I'm not alone or feel like there's somebody expressing the way that I feel mm-hmm. or, or learning how to talk about things or, or these emotions and, or, or just this energy like in, the, in, in the music that I could associate with. And, um, that, that was huge for me, like Pearl Jam. Um, and even, but even like the, like sort of Southern alt rock country alt rock where those lines intersect kind of going back to like you know thinking like elvis and like back in that like where that 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 those crossroads happen and like the gin blossoms and like you know and and better than ezra and like all these like 90s you know bands but um and even late 80s 90s crowded house and um uh, toe the wet sprocket, uh, like uh, guitar driven stuff that yeah. just, but had like words that like sort of resonated with me. Um, and that just kind of stuck with me. And I, I was certainly, I've been like a rock guy, yeah. you know, uh, but I love like all disciplines of music I can appreciate. Mm-hmm. Um, I played, I played jazz in like the high school, in, in a high school band and I was a trumpet player. Okay. Um, so like, you know, I have appreciation for everything. I've always liked pop. Um, mm. and you know, cause there's a reason that it's popular, yeah, right? Yeah, like, cause it, sure. it makes people feel good. Right. Yeah. Like, and, um, yeah, it's just been, a, it's just been a huge, huge part of my life mm-hmm. and a part of my, my creative process, my emotional process, my mental like process, um, and it's always been with me and it's something that I, you know, I, I played in bands and written, written songs and, um, it's always going to be part of me. And, you know, and there was a part of my life in the beginning when like, when I was back, you know, in somebody else's kitchens and there was a time where like, you know, I was in a band and they're like, I, I, we have an opportunity to play this big show and it's like a Friday or Saturday night, of course. Mm-hmm. And I asked for it off. Like, no way. Like, no fucking, no way, fucking yeah. way. No You got to make your way. choice at that you point. You make your choice. Yeah. What are you going to do? And I got to sit down for my chef at the time. It's just like, where were you? What, what where, restaurant? Or, or what are you going to do? And uh, I was the Agora, uh, which was at the time in the nineties, uh, you know, the economy was great in the middle nineties. Right. Um, and Providence was, there was a lot going on yeah uh, and they just built at the time this the first luxury hotel in downtown yeah. providence what was the hotel uh, called uh the westin the, the okay time. the westin okay. yeah which is now it's crazy now like how you know how hotels yeah, like, yeah. change you're know, like wait didn't the omni used to be that building <laughs> or didn't the biltmore used to be there or didn't yeah. the westin or didn't what like and they just switched brands yeah. and different um, names same rooms so, yeah it's like, what and, the fuck? you know but that was that was like a that was a big thing and it was uh, the restaurant that you know, they brought a chef in from Boston and opened up this restaurant and national acclaim and I was lucky enough to get a job there yeah. by, on accident um, and it, it was one of the best experiences of my life but this particular thing that had happened and you know it was just like you got to make a decision mm-hmm. are you going to be a musician or are you going to be a chef yeah. You know, because you can't do both. You can't. Which was, which is right and wrong. Yeah. You know, like as a career, you know, you can only at that time, and it was a different time then. And it was, he was really just saying, like, are you going to give this your all or are you not going to give yeah. it your all? And I just wish, you know, but who knows? Like if I had gotten the night off and more nights off and I tried to do both and I, I, I don't know. And I did try to do both, but I resented him for that, you know? For, yeah. And for stifling your. Yeah. Thinking. And, and it eventually led to me not being able to stay in that band. Cause I could only do shows that weren't on Friday and Saturday nights, yeah, yeah. you know? And so the band had to make a hard decision yeah, too. Like, yeah. We just, and we, yeah. And it well, was just guy like in tough. It or not, yeah, right? exactly. And you, and you know, I'd be put in that position musically and non-musically so yeah. many more times later in life. But like, you just like, it was like a hard, hard thing for yeah. me. But and the band was probably all your friends. Yeah. In the yeah. kitchen, there's probably 
you know, your chef and then a couple douchebags, and you're like, I don't know, I don't yeah, know. No, they were like my family. <laughs> they were like my family too, and you know. But it's like, um, it was just a tough thing, and but it stayed with me, um, you know. And then again, when I left there a few years later, four or five years later, and then before I opened up Nick's, I start, got more heavy back into music again. Yeah. And, playing shows and uh then even when i opened nick's one of the you know one of the many it wasn't the only reason but one of the reasons i i, I was doing breakfast and lunch was so i could play music at night music at night okay I'm like well yeah like, that makes sense you can't i can't have weekend nights off well, i'll just make my like, own reality yeah, i'll just right. make my own reality <laughs> i'll make a restaurant that is only open at, in the morning and at lunch so i can play at night time <laughs> i had this big this big plan you know like i'm like this is gonna do and then you're like, well, wait a minute. If we're open for breakfast, my ass is gonna get up at five o'clock in the morning. Yeah, Can't you know, and I was just that's burning. when the show ends. And yeah, yeah. yeah like, <laughs> man, that was crazy. And thank God I was in my early twenties. But I don't know. It was just like it was tough. But uh, and and Nick's really took off. And there were times where I was just like, okay, am I gonna do this? Am I gonna quit? You know, and I put these, I have a tendency to do this, right? I build these realities in, in my mind, like trying to see things out and I make them so much more, I don't want to say severe, but like intense and they have to be. And be like, okay, if I do this, this and this is going to happen or this, this and this could happen. And, you know, and I'm like, I grew up like no money. You know, we had no money. Yeah. We were like definitely one of the less fortunate financially for uh, you know, resourced families in in the in the in the area, and my parents worked so hard to keep us there and to put us in that school system and to 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 give us all the things that we needed. But it was very evident to me, and that you know, we didn't ha you know we didn't have a lot. And, yeah, you know, I was on. There were times throughout our, throughout our life that I was we were on food assistance where I had to, you know, I was like, we never had name brand anything. Mm -hmm. I was doing hand-me-downs. We would like, especially as a teenager, you know, and it's so awful that kids get like that. It's like, no name brand this, no name brand that. Uh, I was like take, stealing things out of the lost and found just to have like, like a champion sweatshirt or to have like a, a decent pair, like a, a name brand pair of sneakers yeah. or like, Anyway, like, as I got old, and I was working, I worked all through high school. Like, I, I, was, a, I was a janitor at a nursery school. I worked the summers at a summer camp. I would dishwash. I would do, like, I was yeah. I was working all How the time. How old were you when you got the dishwashing job your sister got you? Uh, I was probably four, 13 14, or 14. 13 or 14? I was, yeah, I was probably 14. How long did you stay there? I was there for on and off, I think, for... Over a year. Did you dishwash only or did they let that you? That was dishwashing only. Uh -huh. My next gig, which was the reason I left there, yeah. was at the summer camp. It was a Boy Scout camp. And I was, and I was, um, started off as a dishwasher. I was yeah. there as a camper. I had been going as a Boy Scout. Scouting was a big part of my life. Um, I was dish, I was there as a camper and, you know, they needed staff. I was like a, and they, one of the, one of the, um, camp directors had asked me like, Hey, you, what are you doing for the rest of the summer? Do you want to, yeah. would you be interested in working here? And I was like, yeah, fuck yeah. Like, absolutely. Like I got nothing go going on. And I asked, I called my parents, I asked them and then, and like literally I just fucking stayed there like yeah. for the, for the summer. Oh, that's fucking cool. And I was working in the kitchen, uh, washing dishes, but then pretty soon, you know, it's, it's literally like, it was like a chef. And all teenagers, like yeah, you know, yeah. like we're feeding 400, 500 people yeah. at a clip, like and Do you he's, remember and that he's trying was? to, yeah, Mike Ramos. I'll never forget yeah. him, man. Never forget. How old him. was he? I would say at that time he must have been in his probably late twenties yeah. or early thirties. I would say if I had to guess. Uh, what a cool dude, man. Uh, and that's he actually that summer was pivotal musically for me too because he had a CD player and when. In between, when when there weren't people in the mess hall, he would listen to his, you know, and he's had like the Gin Blossoms, Pearl Jam's first album live, you know, like we were like playing CD, and he would let me play CDs. Oh, and that's there, cool. And there, and like, and so we, I was like really getting to listen to music, and I'm like, 
out in the fucking woods, like, and then he realized that I was like, there were some real like, you know, guys that shouldn't have been in the kitchen, yeah. like, you know, and like, and he just kind of realized pretty quickly that I had a decent head on my shoulders and that, so he would like give me shit to do and I'd end up, you know, prepping or doing things and he's teaching me how to make salad dressings and how to make, you know, on the, on the kitchen manager, you know, who was probably 18 or 19 when on his days off, he would have me come in early with him to make breakfast. And that's the first time I learned how to work a flat top. Yeah. We're making pancakes for 400 people. Yeah. Scrambled eggs for 200, 300 people. Cafeteria is so, a great training ground. Yeah. It was, it was incredible. And um, anyway, that, so I left Gus's. So that was big impactful on like a lot of layers, cooking, music, life. But, you know, back to the, you know, fast forward back to like that, that kind of, early 20s like am I gonna what am I gonna do with my life because there were so many times throughout the career path and throughout your life where you're like do I keep going down this road or mm -hmm. am I, do I want to switch directions yeah am I doing the right thing am I doing me am I what, what should I where should I be and I, there was this fear mm -hmm. about not that the restaurant mm -hmm. business was guaranteed but it, you know it's a paycheck every week yeah and there was a guarantee I was I was able to have a, a steady paycheck right and it wasn't a great paycheck but it was steady and there was a fear inside me about going back to being poor you yeah. know and i let it like it really i'm like i can't and i it was a false you know i guess i was creating a false narrative in my in my mind yeah. but not entirely untrue, but like, so it was like very, I was like, this is, this is like, if I do this, then I'm, I might be like risking everything. You yeah. know, like I can, can I live out of a van? Can I live without a paycheck? How am I going to pay for this? How am I going to pay for that? Like, how am I going to pay my bills, my, my college loans, my, this? like, and I'm like, I can't just, I can't go all in, you know, I can't. I just couldn't bring myself to, even though I wanted it, you know, yeah. like to 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 be without a job. I felt like I would have felt like a failure. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I allowed that fear of of not even of being a failure because I wasn't afraid of like failing at things. Like I was twenty two, twenty or twenty three when I opened up Nick's. Mm -hmm. I bought a house when I was 22, like when I had no money, like I did like, yeah, I've been a risk taker, you know, mm -hmm. my whole life, but there was this, the perception of making, of being a failure and making a bad decision ate at me to the point where I, I couldn't, I just couldn't make that jump. And, uh, I just said, no, I'm going to keep cooking and hopefully build up enough yeah. steam and money. And like, and maybe I'll do it this way and I can do both. And, and I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't maintain both. But I always have been into both and trying to do both. And yeah. I realize now, like, I don't have to make a decision. I don't ever, you know, cooking and music, they're going to be with me for the rest of my life. Yeah. And just, I don't have to, like, be all in on one or all in on the other. And sure. I'll have... You know, and even when we were get, when I was gigging a lot, it was like that was work. It was mm -hmm. like being, it's like when you're working in the kitchen so much that like, yes, there are parts of the cooking that you still will always love, but when it becomes work and hard and like stressful and not fun, yeah, it becomes not fun. And like you, you don't always want to do that for fun anymore because it's fucking work you need like, an escape you know and, yeah. and music is the same way anything is the same way like it's like when you start doing your passion as a vocation like it doesn't mean that it can never be fun but there's a whole other side to it yeah like we gotta get paid we gotta book gigs we gotta like you know the business side of things becomes stress you know can yeah. also be stressful and you're like okay like everything's like this it's not just it's not just cooking it's not it's just everything cooking, in life you know? and like even again, if you're even if you're you know, dead poor and not have a career, it's mm -hmm. still, you know, shit's still rough. So it's still rough. It doesn't still matter. Have, you still have shit everyone to just do. has different problems. Yeah. But and everyone as, has and problems. As, and as you're young, and when you're young, you kind of, again, like, it's like you have those experiences that give you the perspective. You yeah. Hope, you hope give you that perspective. Sure. So th this chef, 
he tells you take this seriously and you do. And I do. And yeah. then um do you still harbor resentment towards him oh, or I as love you, him. as no, you I yeah. Absolutely Who not. is he? Uh I love him. His name is uh Casey Riley. Um he's now like the director of the Newport uh restaurant. Oh wow, wow, yeah. okay, gotcha. Um but he was my chef and I still call him chef when I see him. Uh, and he says, "Don't call me guy. Call me Casey." Yeah. Or, I mean, that know, respect never leaves. It never leaves. Yeah. I love him. He was like a he was such a huge pivotal figure in my life. And but he wasn't afraid to have those hard conversations yeah. with me, you know. And because he cared about me, and because he wanted me, and he saw things in me, and you know, and um, and again, and being in a kitchen then is very different from being in a kitchen now. Everything's evolved and oh, for the better, in, in many ways. Uh, in terms of communication styles and and just lifestyles and expectations, and uh, he's been a very close friend and mentor since you know since we parted ways and mm-hmm. he moved on and became the executive chef at Castle Hill. I almost went with him there. Um, at that time, it was just a singular property for that company, and like he just transformed that whole that whole company um, and took his life in a different direction. And had his own path and his yeah. own story, and but I ended up staying at the at the Agora and becoming the sous chef, and then the chef uh, there for like two years yeah. before I left there. And how long all together? I was there from ninety six to two thousand and one, so about okay. five and a half years, gotcha. so almost six years. Yeah, what prompted about, you leaving? Well, I was twenty two years old, uh, twenty three years old. I was, you know, being paid like forty thousand dollars a year, which seems like a ton of money for me yeah. at that time. It was such a pinnacle, right? But I was only there. I was only making that for that last last year. Yeah, if that, if even the whole year, um, you know. Before then, it was like, it, it was, it was just, it was like peanuts. And I was working seven days a week. You know, I was on pagers. You had pagers. Mm-hmm. Um, it was constantly going off. I was always there. And as, which was, I was so into it. I loved it. I didn't mm-hmm. care. I was like working my ass off. And the management company got bought out by another management company, mm-hmm. you know, a year or two before that. And nothing, things hadn't changed as much. And then things started to really change. Yeah. And they were taking it into like a very, that was right during, you know, Marriott's big boom yep. of like box kind of box store drop hotels down and dirty quick you know lower price just like yep. cut out all the frills and people were into it and it was coming from away from that like luxury, luxury. base so a lot of the hotels as companies as they do like you know they watch what the other one's doing and who's being successful they and just they mimic and copy yeah. and, and Starwood had bought out the Weston brand and taken it from like this like Ritz Carlton kind of uh, vibe, you know, like super amenity based. You know, I was like working with like, you know, these crazy food ex- experiences that I was having at, at a very young age. That I'm so thankful for. And then taking it into a very, like, very business, all business, business first. What's what, what corners can we cut? What so costs can we the, cut? And things just side. started to really change yeah. a lot. And um, and some of them were great. Like, and I'm thankful for that experience because it taught me a lot of business skills at a very young age that I that I still use today. And but from a create, you know, I was at that time a young chef. I'm an artist. I'm a creator. I'm a you know. And they started. We had like four or five F and B outlets in, yeah. in the property and. Um, they started like shutting one or they would just consolidate this one and consolidate this one and this one, you know, there was room service. There was a sports bar. There was the sort of three meal a day place. There was the room, there was a the Agora. Um, there was a library lounge. There was all these like cool like outlets. And then they started like con- shutting it down, sh- yeah. consolidating, leaving the venues open. But then, like getting rid of staff or being this and this and this, yeah, yeah. and then they started to like the, put all these things on my plate, you know. And I was I was writing room service menus, I was doing all the VIP banquet like superstar banquet stuff uh, menus and and executing them. And chef the the executive chef or the F and B director would come over the line on a Friday night and be like, oh, 
and like we'd have like 120 on the books and he'd be like oh can you guys just come over here and help them plate this wedding or like this and then because they had just sent for the people home for just, cutting to just cut to hours cut, just to make just to <laughs> cut hours and that like which is fun you know like i was i'm such a team player i was like, doing whatever but like these things kept happening and happening yeah. and next thing you know like they had let go of the of they had let go of the banquet staff the chef they had let go of the cafe chef they're like well you know you have four cooks on this line why can't you do your food and and that the is, sports bar food. That's the worst fucking thing. Why mentality. can't you do your food and the Why room can't service? You just so do this? I was 20, <laughs> 23. I was doing the room service menus, the sports bar menus, the cat. You know, we were cooking the uh, now open for lunch. We were doing the fine dining stuff all off of this line with like three or four cooks. Um, and I was just no more money, no more hours. I was working like a dog. I was like a Macy. I was like a hundred and fucking, you know. The fucking 145 pounds or 150 pounds like i mean i was just like gaunt i was i was so burnt and i would have done it all day long if i felt appreciated but it felt you know it just felt dirty and it felt like taking like advantage burn, of burn, and i'm like yeah. i'm not going down like this man i'm not like and they was just like well does that sell well, do you really need so, or uh, can you go a couple ounces less on that? Can we make more money? And like these weren't bad questions, but it was just this whole experience that was just like I gotta get the fuck out of here. I'm not. I'm gonna die here. Who were these people? Can you? Pause yeah, yeah, for sure. Chefs or what? Uh... Yeah. So, so these people that were put these rules on you were they chefs? Did they have any sort of? You know, in ret in retrospect, you know they definitely were had a lot of knowledge, and um, and there were one there was one that would had sort of taken. They didn't have an, they didn't hire an executive chef for almost a year, so I was doing a lot of that work. Mm -hmm. And granted, a lot of it I probably I, I didn't have the experience to be doing some of the administrative stuff that, mm -hmm. I, that and. There needed to be somebody, you know, in that position, but I still resented it because I was doing the work. And then when somebody came in and he was had a hotel and corporate chef background yeah. and I just didn't respect him. And I, and that, I was wrong in a, in a lot of ways, but he, he just rubbed me the wrong way. And I was so young and just brash and brazen. And I was like, a I was just like a, you know, I was like a... a kitchen warrior at that point yeah. you know like and it was like being told to do things that i didn't respect and that you didn't want to do you know and i and then all of a sudden after doing menus for a year now i had to like run the menus by him and which was like in my you know i'm like i'm okay with authority i'm not like an anti-authority person at all like but it was like okay I, I was just i remember one time you know, and this kind of encapsulates it. I'd come up with this like dish and, and it was like this orange garlic and thyme, like glazed, like duck. Like, yeah. And he said to me, Derek, you know, orange and garlic just don't really go together. And I just went, Duck Marange. Yeah. Peking duck. Like all those flavors, citrus, garlic doesn't go together. And I was just like, okay. And in my head, like he was just dead to me. <laughs> I was just like, you're done. You're done. You're done. Like, you're bro. done. You're saying this just to say it, or you really, you really don't believe that. Yeah. Have it. You have nothing for me. Right. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the right way to think because I, I look back and I, and I do think know that I did learn some things from him. Yeah. But I didn't respect him. Yeah. As a chef. And you could and see I, why he was I, saying that. And I could see, you know, it, you like, know, yeah, not everybody likes that. And I, I, and I, and I was just shutting it down and I was just like, no man, these flavors work great together and this is going to be beautiful and let me make this for you and you, and you'll see where I'm going with this. And, and it just, you know, anyway, like, so they, you know, to distill it down, there definitely were some chef 
hosts there, you know, one chef there, but it was mostly like corporate, mm -hmm. like corporate di hotel director. So managers. at that point, you did you feel like you had a mentor there, or nah? no? You're left no, to your own no, devices. No, I was, I was like, sort fucking... of left to my. I was learning other things, but in the kitchen, it was like I was just. I was at that point, and I'm, and I'm not that I wasn't learning things from the other cook. I was managing a lot of people that were older than me, and I was yeah. definitely learning things from them as well. But it was, a, a it was crazy, a hard dynamic. Yeah, it's a crazy it's a hard dynamic. dynamic. And I was, um, you know, and it was difficult in some instances because where there was there was pushback and what well, this kid kept yeah telling like me who the fuck am I gonna yeah who the fuck is this guy? And when it was a union shop, so there was like even more brazenness. Like some people could. You know, would talk back because they know that they wouldn't get fired exactly. or like, and yeah, exactly. um, it, it was you know, but it was a great experience. But I was like, I gotta get the fuck out of here. Yeah, and I left, and I I was so burnt out. And I remember having a conversation with my dad at the time, and he was just like, "Listen, Mick, if you're not happy, like, you know, you you, you don't have to do this. You, know, yeah. you don't have to be here. Like, you should if you're gonna work this hard, Derek, like, you should do it for yourself. For yourself, exactly. And I was just like. And I had at that time, like I hadn't taken any time off. I had a bunch of uh, built up vacation that I never, never had never taken. Um, and I've just, and I've never quit anything in my whole life. Like I'm just to a fault, you know, like just to a fault. Like I will go down with the ship. Mm -hmm. um, and I just went and put my notice in and I gave him six months. Whoa. Right? And it's a baller notice. Yeah, I was just like I don't want you to be cuz I I I I still felt, you know, I put five and a half years of my life into that place yeah. and like I felt responsibility to the people that worked there and I don't know if it was 6 months actually. Maybe it was No, it was 3 months, not 6 months. I'm sorry. I gave him 3 months. And the you know, I, I, I had never it's like two weeks. A two week notice to me didn't seem was like that's not fair. It's not yeah. fair to my team. It's not fair to the guests. I made reservations. It's not fair to like this that. You know, I don't even know what the hell I'm going to do. Like, and it was in May, and I got through got them got through graduation season. I got it like three weeks into my notice, and they just called me into human resources and. Like, you know, we really thank you for giving us all this time. I appreciate it. But, you know, we're just going to, you know, we don't need you to finish out the rest of your notice. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Like, I was just doing it to be, you to know, be like, nice. To be yeah. nice. And they're like, we appreciate that. Yeah, and, like, but I, and I realized that that, you know, looking back now, it is hard, like, to have somebody who's checked out. Be around. Be yeah, around. yeah, yeah. You don't want And that. as a leader and as a manager and an employer now, I totally get it. Yeah. Uh, there was definitely more happening, you know, there that there was like animosities and anxieties and like that became really difficult. But, you know, basically that chef couldn't take full ownership of that that hotel until I wasn't there anymore because yeah. everybody there respected me. Everybody came to me. Everybody. That's the worst like, It was just, and I know like, I know that now, like, like being older and understanding, but, and I knew it then too, but like, it was my ship, you know, yeah. and it was my ship and, and they were my, they were my crew. And, um, and it was, one of the scariest but most liberating things, you know, ever. Yeah. And that's when I, I, uh, I started working on my house. I took up, uh, took a plane to California mm -hmm. uh, to see uh, some friends and to go to wine country for the first time. I, you know, I called a regular guest that had been coming in for years that. that that oh, so if you're ever he was in the wine business, if, if you're ever, ever in Napa, and I, and I just called him up <laughs> one day, and like, and I, he's like, uh, can you be here? I'll never forget that phone call. I was like, you know, it was like kind of like a cold call, down. I didn't think he'd take the call. And he, his name was George, what a nice guy. And he's like, uh, I must have called him. He's like, oh, yeah, hi, Derek. Oh, can I call you back? And I was like, 
okay, yeah, sure, no problem. And then he hung up the phone. I was like, oh, that, he's not going to call me back. And then he called me back like three or four hours later. He's like, oh, you know, so you want to come to California? He's like, what do you, uh, what, can you be out here next week? And I was like, what? He's like, I've had a cancellation at one of our, uh, you know, one of our cottages on the, on the, on the vineyard. Yeah. Um, that we usually reserve for like dignitaries and, and, you know, brand ambassadors and people that are visiting. It's like, but it's yours for the, for the week. Hell yeah. If you, if you can be here. Yeah. I'm like, all right. So I like, <laughs> <laughs> fucking booked the flights and this or the car I flew into like LA. Yeah, Cause I was originally going to, we were going to go, I was going to go visit some friends in LA and then Drive spend some time Napa. there and then spend some time. I had friends from college that were like in Everywhere. different places in California. And I was like, gonna, but I ended up just getting to LA and driving right up the five, you know, like right up and going right to Napa, yeah. Napa. And I'm like staying in this cottage and it was just like this mind bending, awesome experience. That place like, changes your life. When totally you see changed it. my life. You're like, what? <laughs> and you know, long story short, at that point in my brain, I was kind of done like cooking. I'm like thinking I got my bachelor's in marketing. Yeah. I'm like, what, what, what's my next move here? Like, I'm not going, I can't go back into what I was just doing. I'm burnt. I'm done. And, you know, I spent that next four weeks or four or five weeks bouncing around. I spent that week there, yeah. which was just magical. Like, went to French Laundry. Sick. Like, got in like on a we on like a. What years is? Two thousand and one. Okay, so it's like a couple years after yeah. the book. Yeah, two thousand one, two thousand. Yeah, two thousand one, definitely two thousand one, summer of two thousand one, and um, then. Anyway, like. I'm crashing on people's couches. You I start ate, cooking for people. Loved. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> seriously, man. I'm like cooking for people. I'm like, you know, we're going out. I'm just seeing, I'm just like, I was like healing, you know, but like also like eating and drinking. And I was like, oh, this is doing this, that. And then I ended up like in L. I, I, it was just a crazy, you know, month. And I'm going to take the rent car back and like, I drive, I'm like, oh, I gotta be in LA tomorrow and I gotta get the rent car turned in. You know, LAX was just like a fucking, it's like, I'm coming from TF Green in Rhode Island. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm like, what is this? Yeah, that's another like, this world is over there. Crazy. That's probably the, you know, cause I don't think, does Rhode Island Airport have international travel? I'm no, sure they do. No, no, not, no, they might now, but they had, they didn't they back in the day, right? Until recently. Yeah. That's what my mom was and, like. She had, cause she was Bradley Airport yeah. in Connecticut. And she had never seen international travel until she got to San Francisco. She was like, what the fuck? Because the jet blue over there flies into the international national side. So she was like, whoa. And I drove down there in a hurry. I'm like, I'm going to miss my plane. I checked in the rent car. I'm like, how the fuck do I get from the rent car place to the... Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't think or plan. And this was back you didn't have a smartphone or no, anything. No, or phone. Phone, yeah, right? no, no phone. Um, and I turned it in. I went through security... And I get up to the gate and I'm like, and I'm like, sir, your flight leaves at this time tomorrow. <laughs> You're like, well, I guess I'm here early. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I end up having to, like, I'm like, oh, fuck. I'm man. not leaving I'm now. Like, so I'm like, yeah, I'm already checked in. And this, That's I got no funny. car. I'm in the middle of this, like, you know, and I was just spent. I had no money left. I'm like physically tired. And I ended up like just trying to get an earlier flight, and a flight, and like they're like, no, you got to stay there. And I'm like, I can stand by. So I'm like hanging out there, and I I had this book in my bag, and I hadn't read it, and I'd gotten it a couple years earlier, and, and never read it because I was working, working all yeah. the fucking time. <clears throat> and I'm like, all right, I'll just fucking read the book, and I start reading the book, and. So up all fucking night reading and laughing, like thinking about all the fucked up things and awesome, cool, bad about like the last five years of my life. Yeah. 
and it was kitchen confidential you okay know? and like and i'm reading this book and i'm just like man this is wild and this is crazy and this is fucked up and this is good and this is awesome and thinking about people in my life that remind me of people in the oh. book and i don't know it's just like like I had this, I won't say that it was like the only reason, but it was certainly made me be like, no man, like I can do this. And and this is, this is, I am like, this is, this is who I am. And this is part of who I am. You know, it doesn't define me, but it is, it is part of me and and it defines part of me and I can totally do this. And it made me miss certain things about being in the kitchen and, and, and and also come to think about like, well, I can do my, I can do my own thing. I can change. Yeah things that I don't like, you know. You can make your own culture. And I can make my own culture and creating and, a culture of care. And I did. And I came back and through after reading that book and kind of like getting re like falling back in love with the idea of mm-hmm. cooking and professionally being in a kitchen and thinking about what the possibilities were and and I decided to start something and I found Nick's um was it already a, uh, it was a little old diner it was a late night diner that okay. I had used to go to when I was in college and uh I had since moved into the neighborhood here in the same house and um I was walking up the street one night you know with one of my buddies who lived on the third floor at the time and we were like you know we probably coming from Murphy's or something and like walking up the street and Nick didn't open at that point in his career. Like he didn't open until one o'clock in the morning. He'd open at one o'clock in the morning and stay open till eleven o'clock in the morning and get oh, the, that's a get the third shift, great shift, the third shift, right? And um, restaurant, hotel, bar, nightclub, police, um, medical, you know, dancers, like. I mean, everyone, everybody, you know, and at the time there were like several places like that in the city. Yeah. There was a lot of violence in the city and late night shootings and things that Mm -hmm. happened very soon after that period where a lot of those places and people just starting to age out. I think a combination of that closed down, like closed and they, and a lot of them closed up, but anyway, Nick was this tiny little old, uh, you know, four foot something like, guy hard of hearing this huge personality but tiny cantankerous feisty little old italian guy right who's who's hard of hearing and he would yell like everything and it was like such a scene and a funny like thing to be in yeah. there like late at night just to have and it was cheap it's like two eggs over because he'd be like talking to his staff like, all loud yeah you could hear it, it. it was just it him. was just him okay and he was yelling at people and <laughs> we went there so much that like you know, we kind of developed like a rapport and an yeah, affection yeah, yeah. for the guy. And if he got really busy, especially towards the end, like he was in his late seventies, yeah, yeah, and he's still doing it by himself. We'd like jump back there and help him. Oh, that's and, like, fucking you know, awesome! And he'd yell at us, "No, oh, get the eggs or get the, you know, get the coffee, put the <laughs> coffee on, Derek." You know, like like, and we were, and we were eating it up because we were like having the bag or yeah. like, a couple of drinks, or it was just fun. It yeah. was like fun, but we were trying to help him. We weren't like you know mocking him or anything. Yeah, we yeah, were, yeah. And we we're trying to make sure he was okay. And we were like, anyway, so that like I had to have that history built up of that space. You know, I'm walking home that night, and my friend Carl and I would see, and Nick is just kind of like, it wasn't one o'clock, so he wasn't open, but he was sitting at the counter and he was all like slumped over, and I was like banging on the window I'm like you know and he looks up and he sees me because I just want to make sure he's alive Mm -hmm. he looks up and he sees me and um, he goes he goes like this he motions me to come in and this is a guy that was always just full of so much piss and vinegar and just kind of defeated he just goes Derek I I don't think I can do this anymore you know that do you you know and we were talking, I'm like, I'm sorry, Nick, are you all right? Like, and he was just like, you know, do you know anybody that might want to buy the place? And I'm like, nah, I mean, nah. And then I'm just, I don't know what the fuck I was thinking. You know, liquid courage, time, place, energy. Like, You're like, I'm well, just, I bought a house I'm already. Like, yeah, I'm like, might as well. 
well, I had, I, you know, I bought the house a year earlier. Yeah. And I'm like, so I, in my home, and it needed so much work. I'm like, I'm kind of stuck here. Yeah. Right? And I really want, I was thinking, if I'm going to be a chef, I'm, I got to get out of prep. I'm going to move to New York. I'm going to move to Chicago. I'm going to move to California, you know, San Francisco, somewhere, you know, the it cities. Yeah. Because that's what you have to do to make it in yeah. this business, right? But there was part of me that resented that also. Mm -hmm. Like, it was just like, like, why not us? Yeah, why, why not, not us? Fucking why not us? Why yeah. do I have to go somewhere? And like, and prove myself to a bunch of strangers. Like, what about where I'm from? What about my community? What about Thanks. my thing? So there was like, you know, there's so many different emotions that were all in, in situations that were sort of converging. And, you know, just this epiphany, you know, to distill it all down kind of came to me. I said to him, like, you know, Nick, let me, let me give it some thought. Maybe, maybe I'll do it, you know, and only half serious, but not, not bullshitting but like at the same time just like i'll think about it like knowing i had no money he fucking called me the next day i was you know he's like and he wouldn't let up and he was just like you know you want to come talk about it what do you even think and i'm like okay like i'll come and talk to you but I, you know and he he forced me to actually consider it and be serious because i told him that i would think about it and yeah and the more I thought about it, the more I was just like, maybe I can do this, you know? And I ended up getting a friend of mine who was one of my roommates, but had moved back to New Jersey. I called him up. You know, his dad had always said, like, hey, you know, like, if you guys, when you guys are ready, I'll back you guys in a restaurant, right? And he moved back home to New Jersey. And, but I called him up. I'm like, Brian, I, I have this opportunity to buy Nick's, like, do you think you want to move back up here and we can do it together? Yeah. Right? And he was cushy and living at home with mom and dad. Like a lot of my friends from New Jersey. He's were, like stressed. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. He's like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but his dad overheard the conversation and he was like, let me talk to him. Thinking that he would ignite some inspiration in his son to like come back up and do it. He's yeah. like, well, you know, let's talk. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do it, you know? And he became my partner. My friend never moved back up here. <laughs> so he was like my like long distance business partner um, for, for like the first year, <clears throat> you know, and with his credit, a couple, we were able to, we had a couple credit cards and, and he invested like 20 grand, mm -hmm. like, you know, for, so like for like 20, 20, 23 grand and like just his credit cards, mm -hmm. I started the restaurant uh -huh. and we were 50 50 in the first year and i ended up buying him out i took a second mortgage on this house which was going to be to fix the house because it was falling apart and i ended up using it to buy you know to buy him out yeah um because he wanted to do he realized his son was going to stay down there and he wanted to be down there and i really wanted full control over everything that was going on there um and I did that and here we are like you know 20 almost 20 years later 20 that was years. 2001 now you know they always say you don't break even until the third or fourth or the fifth year like what 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 was your deal with that <laughs> he's like 15 years man i'm still broke yeah, i'm still broke <laughs> well you know i took a different arc and um if I think, you know, if the business had stayed what it was, you could see, you know, you'd be able to do that. But everything was growth for me. Like yeah. We've been on a constant growth pattern. You know, I was renting there. It was an 18-seat restaurant. And then I, you know, I used, we opened for nothing, like on a shoestring. But yeah. it's like laughable to think about how much money we had. To open, that we got that restaurant open with, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it was like everything got reinvested, you know, paying down debt. And then once we started to pay down the debt and steam started to build up, there was a situation there where it was like, this is, this space isn't going to be, isn't going to work for us anymore. Yeah. Like, um, that must've been, a and good I, and I was started looking to rent somewhere else or Again, this like entrepreneurial craziness, like where I'm like, well, why rent if I could buy something? Let's look and see if that's an option. 
Because to me, like, you know, again, like it was just like, you've got to be the master of your own destiny, which yeah. isn't, you know, correct, but it's was my narrative. It was my perspective at the time. And like, I'm like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to work for myself. I'm going to be self-employed. If I'm going to, if I'm going to do this again, if I'm going to go through this again, with all the shit that I was going through with the landlords and the, the work the building needed and the space needed and dumping money into the space only to have my rent go up and yeah. to have, you know, or for them to finally do work that they were supposed to be doing for a year Years, and then not yeah. pull permits and to have the fire department and the building inspector come and try to shut the restaurant down because they were doing work in their building yeah. without permits and like all these crazy things that were going on that was just like, I need to remove this piece out of the equation. So I found the building that we're in now. Mm -hmm. Took a second mortgage out of my house, put a down payment on this building, got my got my dad to retire from his other job. And one of the jobs he had always done my whole life, second and third jobs, carpentry. And that was his passion, even though he couldn't do it full time all the time. So I got him to retire quote unquote and come help me with the building and for two and a half years we that little tiny shop paid for you know my 18 seat restaurant no liquor license yeah paid to get that restaurant that building built and mm -hmm. it was a piece of shit building the roof was caving in that was the only reason I was able to afford it yeah and um but we, you know, we've never been afraid, afraid of hard work. So we, we did that. So, I mean, kind of like, it's, it's hard to answer the question that you asked about, you know, when do you see that break even until, because I've never seen it, right? Like, and. Because <laughs> you're but, always constantly. Because we're don't. constantly. Yeah. We're constantly like building for the future mm -hmm. and reinvesting. And it's been an evolving. It's been evolving the whole time. Yeah. So. So it's really hard to look at it as a as like a clear cut financial mm -hmm, piece mm -hmm. and say, you know, we were doing good here. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I certainly now, can look at business, just the yeah. arc of like business, and say revenue were was, were did X, Y, and Z here, but in in relevance to expenses, it's almost like felt like it's never been like yeah, because yeah. it's been a passion project, and like you know, I've always like you know we buy great ingredients, we pay decent wages mm -hmm. we we put a lot of craft and artistry into what we do we try to use smaller producers when we can and those things cost more money and mm -hmm. we're giving back and doing doing charity work and doing um you know all, all these different pieces that are that are costly mm -hmm. and eat away and erode those you know those the p word the profit um but you know, I look back on at what we've done and there's been some real hard times. And this year was the toughest of the toughest, you know, but, you know, I started the business after mm -hmm. like during 9-11. Like that was awful, awful experience. We got through that. A few years later, you know, there was like the station fire, uh, which just. That was that nightclub. Gripped the entire Rhode mm -hmm. Island. There was a nightclub fire, mm -hmm. but, you know, which impacted the, 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 the music and and. Uh, and an entire state at, yeah. by the heartstrings, but also totally shifted and changed the operational procedures and guidelines yeah. of how to operate, Fire marshals, how shit. to operate a restaurant well, and anything like that. that. And it, I mean, catastrophically, yeah. this should happen. What? 50, 40 minutes from here? Yeah, not even. Yeah, it was yeah. in Warwick. It was in West Warwick. Warwick. Right? It was like, I like drive 50, by that building sometimes was, and I'm like, I was driving by it yeah. the night. It, I mean, we're not right by it on the street, but I had band practice in a studio in West Car in West Warwick uh -huh. that night. I didn't know that that show was going on. It was yeah, like a, yeah. It was a great way. It was like an 80s rock band. Like, it wasn't my scene, but like, I just remember driving home that night and seeing smoke, just thinking it's a Warwick fact, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, and finding out the next morning at Nick's, like when I'm opening and the paper on Reading the, the counter and I'm like, what? Yeah, that was devastating. And it was awful. But, you know, beyond the emotional, it also changed our industry and, yeah. and it changed like what it took to be able to open and operate and the costs involved yeah. and the steps involved. And 
fast forward, opening, you know, moving there, opening a new space, going through the legal and zoning and permitting and it's crazy. Uh, anyway, but like to go, I mean, I could spend an hour on every single one of these, yeah, sure. <laughs> every single one of these stories and hopefully it's not too all over the place. No, but it's like, all good. You know, I started with nothing. We started the business out of, you know, with with some equity from my house. Then I bought my partner out with some equity mm-hmm. from my house. Then I bought the building that we're in now and started it with, you know, as the housing market was going like this, yeah. which I took, you know, was able to build equity up in the house and use that equity to then to pay for that. that. But it was constantly like a, so the house kept getting put on hold, but if I didn't have the house, I wouldn't have had anything Anything when I had the opportunities to do these things. And then I ended up buying that space. And then when we finally started to like make things make sense and things were, we're paying down debt, Mm -hmm. we're figuring things out. Systems were getting really efficient. Then I went and, then the economic crisis happened. Yep. Banking collapse, crazy to live through that from a business standpoint. And then we survived that barely. Um, and then started to climb out of it. And then I ended up having the opportunity to take over the building next to mine. Mm-hmm. And there was somebody that had owned it. It was like not a great neighbor. And again, it became more of a like, I need to control my own destiny. Yeah. We shared the parking lot. His building was about to be condemned because of his neglect and just other things going on. Tenants from his building. And you know, people thought I owned that build, co- yeah. co-owned it because I owned the restaurant and we didn't. So like he he had tenants that didn't have hot water. That they would come to you and be like, hey, man. To me. My door's broken. I just got broken into. My dad and I would go over and fix it just to be good neighbors. Yeah. And like, shit like that would happen. Like, And I'm like, when the opportunity came, I, we had no money. Uh, but again, like the opportunity to buy that building came and I'm like, I have to be the master of my own destiny here. And, and I begged, borrowed, steal, like not didn't really steal, but like you get the, you know, we bag and borrowed and figured out how how to just make, how to it, make happen. it happen. Yeah, and then spent the next ten, you know, seven, eight years trying to survive, make it make sense, making that happen. Yeah. Um, and then you know, it's like one thing happens after another, and um, so much has happened in our industry and in the economy, and yeah. then I tried to open. I opened Westminster uh, and then Corona virus happens yeah. and um, bam, like the, everything, everything pulled the plug, pulled yeah. the plug and um, I ended up having to close Westminster. It's mm-hmm. like overnight. Is it like now- 55 people I had to lay, including myself, like yeah. 55 people get laid off. And uh, it was just like this, oh, like, just another chapter in the yeah. in the oh what the fuck the fight, you yeah. know the fight the struggle uh and i've had to come to terms with like that and also rebuild and adjust and yeah. where's the next thing going and what's and here um, we are what did the westminster was the westminster another nicks yeah so i started um yeah it was Nick, nicks on westminster i was okay, trying to okay. uh, kind of create a different vibe there was a hotel that was going to be built uh, down there, mm-hmm. uh, and somebody asked me, you know, to what I think about doing a Nix down there or something like it. And I thought about doing a different concept, and then I thought about the the appeal of like kind of growing the brand, yeah, and creating a, 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 a downtown piece that would sort of allow me to kind of do some of the things I was doing there down there. Then have it find its own way and then be able to evolve that. And yeah, just, yeah. You know, and like I had all these ideas and thoughts and intentions and, um, you know, and then like as it does, life happens. Yeah. And um, the hotel was supposed to be open before the restaurant and we built the restaurant to service the hotel, you know, big and like expansive. And the then hotel. the hotel didn't happen. Yeah. And then Corona. You're like, happened, where the hell are we going to get our and guests? And like, you know, and I've yeah. got a, 
$11,000 a month rent. I've got a $10,000, $11,000 a month loan mortgage mm-hmm. to pay. We've got, you know, payroll was like anywhere between fifteen and $22,000 a week. Yeah. Jeez. And like a 10-year lease. Yeah. All this crazy stuff going on then in within our first year of opening. And, uh, and I had to make the hard decision like to – to close it just kind of close it and try to survive and it was like kind of like a startup all over again it was like 2001 all over again and it's just me and it was just me you know the beginning of corona it was just me and two other cooks and 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 two of my key front of the house people and and we just started take out only take out only because we weren't able to not to do anything more than that until June uh, or late May, June, and it was just building back up again, building, 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 and that's kind of where we're at now. Yeah. Where we're just like, what's the future going to hold? I don't know, but that's left me, you know, reorganizing, reimagining, rethinking. You know, where do I want to be? Where do I want the restaurant to be? Where do I want? Where do I want my time? My impact? How do I want to use my platform and my voice? And like. Wh- all these questions yeah. and for the first time going back to the what it's like to be a cook when it when the music stops right and you're yeah. just like oh, now shit. you have to you like you have to think about these things mm-hmm. and you've got time to think about it and you have a necessity to think about it and how do we you know, how do we overcome. adapt yeah. adjust overcome and reimagine where the future goes and, yeah and and here we are. <laughs> how did you see the the? How was the evolution of the food? Because when you first took over Nick's, it was a breakfast spot open. Well, for- you know, my idea with food, you know, my food philosophy, and again, I could wax on about this for hours and hours. But like, if I have to like distill it down to some smaller sound bites, because um, I'm just like you know talking, and <laughs> I'm just talking and talking and talking. That's fine. Um, um, like, if I have to distill it down, I would say that like my idea when I opened Nick's for food was like. At that time, you know, fine dining, you know, like what we mean by fine dining, right? Hard work, integrity driven, handcrafted, no corner cutting, real wholesome ingredients, not just fine dining from a price point standpoint, right? When we think about fine, what we're really talking about is fine cooking, right? Yeah. Right? Gourmet, you know, you can package it with whatever words that you want at the time or now, but it was like, honest like integrity driven handcrafted chef driven mm-hmm. real ingredients um but did you say to yourself i was doing that at agora we were everything we made everything from scratch yeah it was the best of the best ingredients no corner cutting and i'm like but it was unaccessible from a price point mm-hmm. and also there was just this pretentiousness you know it's like my family couldn't come to eat here yeah you know uh, I couldn't afford to eat here. Uh, and there was an attitude and a inaccessibility and a, uh, you know, stick up the assness of, of that lifestyle and of that thing. And part of the, like the pomp and circumstance was kind of cool and fun, but part of it was also like really as somebody who grew up kind of poor and like it w- and as it got more corporate in terms of the behind the scenes, yeah. It would just kept further like sucking out the love and the passion and the connection of the communal eating experience, right? So my goal for Nick's from a food perspective was to return to, you know, like why isn't anybody cooking this kind of food in a way that's accessible to yeah. people? Price point wise, time of the day. At that time, you either did dinner and you were a serious restaurant or you didn't. You know, yeah. you there weren't the breakfast. Breakfast was breakfast. Curious, it was yeah. breakfast. Yeah, you know, and there were so many people, and I believe me, I had so much self doubt in the beginning. You're doing breakfast, <laughs> and so many chefs and other people that would like, you know, oh, you're, oh, you're going to do eggs. Yeah, you're gonna but do where, eggs. where the fuck you're, were they two years in? You're, you're going to do Eating eggs. Brunch. <laughs> you're going to do eggs. You're going to do eggs. This was before, like, you know, the commu- the the chef counter had. Mm-hmm. This was before any of that, you know. This was before David Chang, you know, and took the Mama Fuku. This is, you know, right at the cusp of like when Paul Kahn was doing Blackbird in Chicago, which were similar kind of like, yeah, like let's let's get down and let's dirty get and get let's yeah. get real, 
right? And I was working on it, not from a comparative, but like, cause this is just how I felt. And there were obviously other people in the country that also felt similar things, yeah. right? Like, and it was like, I want to cook in a place where cooks can afford to eat. Yeah. And, and that people can to. afford to feed. And like, I want people to re-engage with the act of like breaking bread and the spiritual, like communal sense. And mm-hmm. it was a diner. So it was a chef's counter unintentional chef's counter like that's the the space could only be that it was less it was 600 square feet like you know so anyway that defined like the space and my want of that just like wholesome and i did breakfast and lunch one so i could play music but two from a business perspective thinking like nobody was doing you know there were a hundred places for dinner dinner, yeah you know and i didn't have the money i couldn't get a liquor license yeah I didn't have the money for nice china, nice glassware, anything yep. like that. All the things that I knew people would expect for nice dinner. And so I, I had to really eat some humble pie, serving on like plastic plates with with a you know twelve dollar pack for a hundred yep. silverware and like that you could bend. You know they were like made out of, <laughs> made out of paper clips. You know, but it was just about the food yeah. and about the feeling and about like I was doing, you know the same you know and integrity and artistry and thoughtfulness that went into these dinner experiences and putting it in a to a breakfast and a lunch experience and it really resonated with people and it, it took off faster and crazier than i mm-hmm. could have expected yeah. and we so- had you know and again it was only 18 seats but like it became a thing right and like there were like it was sunday and there'd be like line out the door just, hanging out Every, all over Broadway. And yeah. even, this was even when the Columbus was still like a dirty movie theater. And like, and then we're only, only it was only us and Julian's and, oh, yeah. and uh white electric on, on the street. And, um, you know, and it became a thing and it just became a thing. And, mm-hmm. and we created this, this thing, uh, you know, us and Julian's and white electric and, and, it really impacted the food. And as I tried to get better and better at cooking and better at, 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 at the menu started to evolve and, you know, we got some great write-ups in the New York times and the Boston globe. And it was just like, it was just, it was, it was new. It was like a new thing. Like yeah. people just like, I can get really awesome. Like I can get the same quality meat and, and cooking for like, breakfast and brunch and that be it would become before brunch became a hashtag yeah exactly before hashtags were hashtags yeah, and yeah. like you know and it was just this like hey like i can enjoy this other part of my day that i thought was just like you know yeah. food is fuel kind of thing right um and it started it just started so organically um and it was like you know the first couple of days we did like you know like 20 30 people and we're like, oh my God, well, I was just like, I'd make a new soup every day. I'd bake muffins every morning and I'd make a new soup every day. And I would send Steve, my, my, my partner out and he would, he was, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was the waiter. I was the cook. I had one other cook. It was a friend of mine and it was just two cooks and one waiter. And I would be like, Steve, like just here's some grilled bread and some bowls and some soup. Just, and we would just drop them off to businesses. It was just, like I didn't have a marketing budget. That yeah. was still back when magazines. It's like ten thousand dollars a page, five thousand. <laughs> you know, Providence. Like, it's like I, I, it wasn't even an option. Yeah. It wasn't even an option. Mm-hmm. Like no marketing budget. So it was just we're going to put food in people's mouths. Yeah. And it catalyzed and catalyzed, and and that became like the mantra. And it really the journey as a chef and as a young cook and. Uh, as a community member, like it became, you know, I lived here, was working here. So that like the, the local thing, eat local, create local, support local. It became like a, not just like, it wasn't from a, it was from a, like, I want, I, I want to support. Yeah. I want the best ingredients. Why can't I buy these? Where are they available? Why aren't there any ways for me to buy from farmers? That was before farmers markets were mm-hmm. like a thing, before Farm Fresh, before like, you know, it was just like, if I wanted something, I had to go drive to the farm to get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it just, all of those things in life and just sort of 
really it was just about being fresh, wholesome, delicious, and accessible, mm-hmm. right? And um, and then it's just evolved like from there. And now I look back at where we are now, and it feels, especially the beginning of the pandemic, it was just like a return to basics. Like, what can I do? What do people need? Mm-hmm. right now because there's a service part of our service industry right that we often forget about as chefs and creators and living our own lives and is that we can't exist without people without people right and we shouldn't like why, i mean otherwise we're just cooking for ourselves yeah, right exactly, yeah. and that's fine if you're if you're eat, cooking to eat but like if you're cooking for business or if you're cooking for a purpose right like you've got to feed people right yeah. and you've got to feed people not just what you want but what they want and what they need right and it's up to us to artistically and creatively and spiritually like you know pay attention to what people what we think people want and need right mm-hmm. and so that has throughout my entire career influenced you know and we've taken detours uh, you know but at the core and at the soul which is something I've been forced to reckon with these last 12 months especially Mm -hmm. right it'll be really we're in february right and that's really when this started right so we're a year into it right one year into covid and the impact it's had on our world right not just our industry but and i've had to reckon with the realities and the and just the core like who am i what is my purpose what should i be doing right now and how can I do that in a way that's meaningful, purposeful, that spiritually fills up my cup, also financially provides for my family and mm-hmm. for my team and creates livable wages and, 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 a, and a comfortable, safe and wondrous environment that they can thrive and live in and not just get through. And, but also, that same thing for my community. Like, how can I be of value, right? And I don't just mean monetary value. Like, how can I, like the monetary value hopefully comes after you fill the other niches, right? It's like, if I am something that people, that helps people, that, that they that they feel that they not just need, but like want, right? Then I'm I'm giving value back to them. And if I'm a value to them, then they will, support me and and my ideas and what i'm doing and it's a it's a reciprocal it's a circle right and to get not to get too philosophical or too deep but like you know it's you know whether you call it a circle that that needs to stay connected or whether you you know use uh, one of the other many adages like a table that has legs right and without the right amount of legs it falls over right and and whether i'm talking to myself or whether i'm talking to my staff about unity with each other or how to treat farmers and drivers and vendors with respect because we need them yeah right or whether we're talking about our guests right we need them right and they need us right and it's a symbiotic relationship and without all of those pieces right and now we 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 could take a layer out right and we see what's going on with the world and global warming and just environmental crises and health crises and how we're connecting the dots how they're actually not separate they're all fucking connected Mm -hmm. and socioeconomic crises are causing you know human health crises which are causing economic uh, uh environmental right and you start to zoom out and you see the connectivity that they're all legs of the same fucking table, right? And it falls down when they're not supported, yeah. right? And, and you know, I look at what we're doing and what we're trying to do, and I'm like, how can I have impact and how can I be successful and have longevity and have use to yeah to my family and to my community? And, uh, and I think about it and, like, yeah, we can do that, like, through food. And I'm thinking about, like... You know where I am as a business, what we do, like, and I thought about like this piece that's been missing, like, or not missing, but like that I've just realized that like I need to feel whole, like I need to be of service, right? Like, and it's just been part of my life, my whole life, whether it was through the church or through scouting or just through my parents and like the responsibility of, of like being a good human mm. and 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 then coming up in a in a in a good kitchen, like with this sense of like. Respect. respect and like and in responsibility and 
it's like, I need to be of service. And I've been, my work with Chefs Collaborative over the last 10 years as a, as a volunteer, as a member, as a, and then becoming a leader and a board member and a co-chair and, and what are we doing and where are we going with, the, with that organization and what, you know, we what is our need? What is our impact? What, how can we, how can we really be of service? Right. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I, where I'm at right now. And I'm thinking about hunger, you know, and I'm thinking about like, what can we do? Like we've been throughout COVID, even when we were hurting and we didn't know if we were going to be able to open our doors and we were asking the community for help. I mean, I started to go, I started to go fund before any of the governmental funding came out before anything, anybody knew which way was it. I'm like, I'm going down. Yeah, I'm going down and I'm not going to be able to provide for my family. I'm not going to be able to provide for my, my workforce. Uh, I st- started a GoFundMe page, you know, and we started and I was so humbled and taken aback by the help the and, the, and the support and the people and the kind word, not just the yeah. money, but like the words that people said like that, like got me through mm-hmm. like and immediately with that money we kept our doors open half of it went right out to the employees and then we started doing free meals for kids and like like for hospitality workers and for our workers that were displaced and for first responders and we continued even when the money ran out like to do you know deep deep discounts for everyone in the medical and hospitality fields, right? Right. Like to try to just to, to do our part, right? Like, and we'll continue to do that. Right. And I'm like now thinking, cause if we, you know, I'm not working 120 hours a week. I'm only working 70 hours a week, yeah. you know, or 60 hours a week. And I have these little spaces and time and like where my brain swelling has sort of gone down in some areas. And I'm like, how do we, how do I focus that impact? How yeah. can I, be of service how can we how can i because i really know as an artist and as a creator that i can't truly be fulfilled i can't really be creating from the right place if i don't have that that need you know whether that's my need or someone else's need and being a small business owner there's always something you know like it's never easy yeah especially in this industry when you're trying to do things the right way um but I know that like I can't be whole unless I'm serving yeah, somebody else. Exactly. And uh and that's you know, and that's where we are and the food will continue, I think, to evolve and reflect that. Yeah. And and who knows where it's gonna go. But um whatever happens to us in the restaurant and and my cooking style, it will always be reflective, you know, and come from that 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 place. Fuck yeah, yeah. chef. I don't think we can end it any better than that. <laughs> Um, Sucio Talk signing off, Chef. Thank you very much for this. This was an awesome conversation. Sorry, Dave. It's so good to see you, brother. And um, I'm sure some some people out there will draw inspiration from this talk. And uh, I think my biggest takeaway from you is um, uh, success isn't just about money. You Amen. know, success is about what you can do for others and uh, and yourself and growing. So thank you, Chef. Cheers. Episode 13 signing off.